Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. I'm David Prosser. I'm the Executive Director of um, RUK, and we're very uh, pleased to be able to uh, co-host this uh, meeting today with uh, COPIN uh, on open access monographs and the transition from um, uh, to, to make mandates uh, a reality. We've got a great uh, uh, slate of speakers um, today, and um, hopefully uh, we're going to um, um, have a really good discussion also with, with you all. Uh, just a little bit of in introductions to start with. Um, RUK, uh, as many I'm sure will know, is a representative body representing 39 research intensive libraries in the UK and Ireland. Uh, these are mainly university uh, members, uh, so that means that uh, our, our members are, are, are the people who uh, are impacted uh, by open access policies, both around journals and uh, monographs. Uh, COPIM is the community-led open publications infrastructure for monographs uh, project, and that's an international uh, partnership of researchers, universities, librarians, open access book publishers, and infrastructure providers. And that's a, its aim is to build community-owned open systems and infrastructures to enable open access book publishing to flourish. Um, the, the the solstice that has just passed sort of makes you think about about the passing of time and about the seasons and about cycles and obviously within academia we we are we are um, uh, we we have lots of those um, different types of cycles the most obvious one being the academic year and then that changes and you know, that comes through but also in policies there's the ref cycle and it often feels as if one finishes and then a new one starts. Um, and also within within all of that, there is also that con constant feeling of change. So these cycles come along, but each time the cycle is slightly different. Um, I th and so we're used to working uh, within an evolving environment. And it also feels like that's around open access policy. I and mean, the UK has had open access policies for journals for something like 15 years now, and they have cycled through and they've changed and they've been adapted uh, as, as, as time goes on. And we have just got used to implementing the most recent of the, um, of the open access journal policies from UK RI. But the, some of the, the part that is new is the forthcoming um, open access monograph aspect of the policy. Uh, the, and that seems to be coming towards us at an ever increasing rate. And it, it, but that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have this, um, this, this session this afternoon to, to talk through some of those issues. And we'll hear more about the policy and also about how reactions to the policy and, and, and how we might um, engage there as we go through um, this afternoon. Um, I think that most of the people who are part of this call today are from the UK, but we also welcome uh, uh, our colleagues uh, internationally who have joined us um, today. Uh, we hope that you will get um, a lot out of, of, of these discussions, but we also hope that through the chat, through the questions and through the discussions, you can also bring your experiences of open access uh, monographs and policies into the discussion. So we look forward to hearing from you as well as we go through the, the day. Um, thinking about ways of communicating, you can put, uh, you can use the chat uh, function to um, uh, put your thoughts um, uh, or, or to put questions for the speakers as we go through. Uh, you can also raise your hand if you'd like to share any comments um, um, as, as we go through or, or ask your question yeah, yourself. Uh, the hashtag today is, 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 is slightly long, but it's, I hope it makes sense. It's, it's the hashtag is R-O-U-K, COPIM, that's C-O-P-I-M. OA, that's all one, all one word. And the meeting is being recorded and we will make that a recording available um, after the event. And Martin has very helpfully uh, put the uh, hashtag into the, uh, into the, in, in, into the chat there. Um, so we will begin by setting the scene uh, in, in terms of what the policy is and, and that, that we're working towards and, and why it is that we want to um, uh, talk about that um, today. Um, our first speaker is Rachel Bruce. Uh, Rachel is from uh, UKRI, and I think will be very familiar to um, most of the most of us in in in, in the UK as uh, the lead on open science for uh, UKRI, and somebody who has been um, instrumental in formulating uh, the policies around open access 
um, um, over over the past few years uh, for UKRI. I think that uh, many of us have had uh, many many discussions as as part of the um, part of the extensive consultation that UKRI undertook in formulating this policy. Uh, so, Rachel, I can hand over to you. I think. Thank you very much, David. Right. So, my first. Um... <laughs> Thing to try and do is to share my screen. So let me just get that going first. Um, can I just ask, David? Does um, that we, we, we're seeing the presenter view at the moment. Uh -huh. uh, uh, that is um, perfect, almost as if rehearsed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and. Um, I am really pleased uh, that this event is being held. In fact, it is so well timed because, um, as David has mentioned, we have um, introduced the article policy. And as the rest of the sector has been, we have been busy toiling away with the early implementation of the research articles policy. But we are, um, as we have um, committed to uh, starting work to clarify implementation on the long form um, policy. So um, yeah, so this is really well timed um, and hopefully you'll see why as I go through. So I will give a little bit of context to the policy, outline what the policy is, and then also talk about um, some of our plans and priorities around implementation of that policy. Indeed, the things that we think we need to do in order to make our mandate um, a reality. Um, so most people will probably know um, that UK Research and Innovation um, is the largest funder, um, largest public funder of research in the UK. Um, and so we, we cover a whole wide variety of disciplines and we also um, have bodies such as Innovate UK and Research England which undertake slightly different um, roles within the research system. Um, but overall our, our vision just to stay at a high level is of course to help um, deliver an outstanding research and innovation system and that is about enriching lives really at a local, national and international level. Um, and we make very clear in our new strategy that our mission is really about making sure we connect discovery and research to prosperity and the public good. So all of those um, aspects around um, global challenges, but also just enriching people's lives and making sure that research achieves um, what what the funding is actually allocated for. Um, so where does open research sit within that? So within UKRI's strategy, we have a few policy priorities, um, which we are collectively working on under the banner of research, culture and environment. Um, and they are equality, diversity and inclusion, research integrity, research and innovation culture and open research. And in a way, the work that we're doing there can be seen as um, a change programme um, across everything that UKRI does and also working in partnership with relevant stakeholders. Um, so for example, we expect open research to be part and parcel of all of our funding considerations um, and not just um, a policy that doesn't integrate into other policies or a policy that isn't supported by our infrastructure investments. So all of those things um, need to be working together collectively. Um, and that's the point of um, these key strategic priorities to help the research and innovation system achieve that end goal and our, um, our mission. Um, in terms of open research, so th there are three key areas that, that we're working on. Um, so one is the open access to publications, which this is part of today. Um, the other open data, and I always say open data et al, et al because um, that would also include um, code, um, methods, and really opening up 
um, the, the research process um, more generally and where appropriate. And then um, open culture. And so we're doing quite a lot of work around um, incentives, um, also um, skills and training, um, but part and parcel of the agenda really of reforming research assist assessment as well. So um, that's a key aspect in terms of our open research strategy. So the backdrop um, to this policy um, starts well before actually the government um, R&D roadmap, but I, I just wanted to highlight that um, at a government level, um, in the latest research and development road map, the, the idea of open research being absolutely essential um, comes through quite strongly. And they're very clear that mandation of open publication is required for publicly funded research. And so, of course, that is an important um, backdrop to um, our policy, especially given that we are the largest public funder of research in the UK. So, as I think everyone here knows the open access review that informed this policy um, took some time um, because of course open access um, is a, a, a change agenda and it is really quite contentious with many different views. Um, I, I suppose the only real point I wanted to make here for today was we started off with a review um, based on um, an established research articles policy and there was an open question as to whether to introduce long form outputs um, and to have a monographs policy. Um, so that, that was considered early on um, and um, our decision was that yes, we would include um, long form outputs. And the basis really for that, as again, I think lots of people here um, will be aware of, um, that there have already been quite a lot of work and consideration around um, the value of open access to long form outputs, and in particular monographs, in um, a lot of policy discussions. So in particular, the Universities UK monograph work led by Roger Kane. Um, we had also prior to that had um, the work of Geoffrey Prosick um, considering um, monographs and open access to monographs and how that may be challenging, but also what the benefits might be um, and what might be sensible approaches to achieving open access. And again, looking internationally, there were either other funders um, introducing mandates or having introduced mandates or considering introducing a mandate. And then that all important one um, within the UK environment um, of the, the REF, um, and it had already been um, announced in discussions that monographs and an open access requirement for monographs would be considered in the next ref, although none of us know exactly when the next ref will be. And um, so some way into the future. So it was considered the right time um, to introduce the policy and if not now, then when, um, but in order to make that policy um, feasible, um, given the maturity of the landscape, we needed to um, consider the shape of it quite carefully so that indeed um, it would be um, feasible to implement. So the policy overall, of course, um, includes research publications, as I've said, um, but today we're focused on um, the monographs aspect of the policy um, and the policy applies um, for monographs published on or after the 1st of January 2024. Um, of course, we're aware of the, um, the timeframes um, and that there may well be contracts already in place, which would mean um, that publication on that date um, would not be able to be compliant. So we've made sure as well, there are um, exceptions um, in the policy that will allow um, for certain circumstances. Uh, just to give, I suppose, a bit of a parallel to the research articles um, policy, so of course much more mature um, here in terms of 
the, the landscape and um, models to achieve open access, um, albeit perhaps um, models that we don't want to necessarily persist within the monograph space. Um, but immediate open access is that policy, it's CC BY. Um, yes, there is a, a case by case exception for ND. We've tried as far as possible to make sure that our policy is permissive um, and therefore the version of record and the author accepted manuscript is um, recognised um, and different routes through journal publishing or, or through repository publishing. So we, we've taken a, a similar approach um, for the monographs policy, but of course it is not um, di directly the same. There are many differences and, and those differences, as I've, I've said, is, is partly down to the maturity of the landscape, um, but also there may well be some things and that, that we might want to um, shape differently working in partnership with others in terms of how to achieve openness in this environment. Um, but the policy essentially applies to monographs, book chapters and edited collections, again version of record and author accepted manuscript, which I was quite surprised actually in the consultation, you know, came up as an accepted concept in, in this space. Um, the difference here with uh, the licensing is we're very permissive about the license requirement. So you, you can, you know, CC by N, ND, CC by ND and C um, are, are all acceptable. And of course, there is an embargo period. And also that concept around an author accepted manuscript we recognize is far less mature in this space. And, and so we've made it very clear in the policy that um, where it is an AAM, it needs to be clear that it's not the final published version. In terms of um, the, the policy, there are numerous um, exceptions or um, outputs that are out of scope. Um, so I suppose the, the major one um, is around third party materials. So um, there may be times when, of course, there are too many barriers in terms of um, getting reused permissions, and it may undermine um, the scholarly output in this case. So if that is the case, then we have um, an exception. Um, and then also there's the um, exception around where there may be a suitable or specialist, it was very hard to define, I have to admit, publisher um, that is working in such a specialist and niche area um, that they cannot offer open access. Um, and then various outputs that are out of scope, so exhibition catalogues, um, trade books, etc. Um, so I think in terms of the, the, the title of today, I, I hope that the way in which we've shaped the policy is indeed supposed to be um, in a way that is nuanced, considers the evidence, considers the landscape, and therefore um, enables a, the, the mandate um, to become a reality. Um, but of course, in order to do that, there's a lot of collective working um, required. I also just wanted to touch on, um, because a lot of um, consideration and heat is always on um, the article policy, and we talk about these key considerations that we had in setting the research articles policy, so one around author choice, um, so basically making sure that there are, um, there are enough um, publication venues that are compliant with our policy, so that authors have a choice um, whatever discipline they are in. And then, of course, affordability um, and sustainability. And sustainability actually does pertain to um, being sustainable for the research sector, but also the publishing um, sector and publishing models. And of course, equality, diversity and inclusion. So that these were key issues in terms of setting um, the article policy. And again, they are also key issues for the monograph policy. And in terms of author choice, um, the way in which that plays out, I've already mentioned the specialist publisher exception, that's, that's one aspect. 
but also the way in which um, we, we, we want to support um, the funding in the policy is to support a variety of different publishers and um, publisher models. Um, and that will also um, relate to monitoring and evaluation and, of course, stakeholder engagement and making sure that we do that in such a way um, that there is um, author choice. Affordability, really hard to predict in this space. Data is quite poor. So, um, and, and also what we do know, of course, we're talking about a whole different um, model where I think, well, Duncan Wingham, who is executive champion for um, open science in universities, uh, sorry, UK um, RI, he always says, yes, it's more of a labor of love in this space um, than a, a commercial enterprise. So we recognize that, you know, we're, we're not talking about the same um, economic landscape, but what we want to do is seek a variety of different models. Um, and of course, you know, we, we have to keep our eye on affordability. And that also links into sustainability. So this whole concept, and it came through very strongly in the um, consultation and all of the stakeholder engagement that maintaining bibliodiversity was really important, um, making sure that um, engagement around innovation um, was acceptable. And, and in the discussions that we had with various different types of publishers, so uh, uh, publishers from the big commercial operations um, and university presses, and also um, new models that are emerging, innovation was important to all of those um, publishers, I, I would say, in our discussions. Um, and I think our considerations around equality, diversity and inclusion are, are really very similar where we've set a policy where we will um, make sure that we're open and listening. Um, we will always seek to make sure there is access to everyone and we will monitor things carefully um, and where we need to, we will have case by case exceptions. Um, so in terms of where we are with um, implementation, so in the same way as uh, for the article policy, so part of the funding that we have provided to GISC um, is to also um, support the, the long form output policy. And so in the same way, having work around the negotiation of agreements, also considerations around infrastructure for monographs, um, advice and guidance, communications, um, and um, strong engagement with um, a range of different publishers um, to seek um, to develop um, open access agreements. Where we are in terms of um, our planning for some of the key areas that we um, need to clarify in detail, um, I've just got these mapped out in a table that my colleague to hear, um, who is leading on our uh, monographs policy implementation has, has put together. So obviously, as I mentioned, we've got exceptions. Now managing and defining exceptions around third party materials um, and, and trade books and specialist publisher exception is quite complex. And we recognize that through our consultation that we need to define this, um, but also implement something which is really based on um, understanding the workflows and where the decision points are made. So we are starting work on that. We will commission some external expertise to um, help guide us. And we will also undertake um, workshops um, with a range of different stakeholders to help define um, those processes. Um, also, copyright and licensing um, guidance is very important. So um, we've been working with JISC in terms of a guide um, for the policy in general, um, but again, around third party rights um, and the treatment of third party materials, we probably need something um, richer and more in depth for this area. Um, we have, as part of the policy, um, support made funding available. And at the moment, um, we've, we've stated that there's 3.5 million per annum um, earmarked 
for this policy and we are now scoping out the mechanism and the options for that um, and again we will have um, some workshops with stakeholders to help um, develop that and make sure that that model um, is as inclusive um, as it can be. Um, stakeholder engagement is going to be very important. We've already announced that we will have a stakeholder forum for the articles policy. We've recently made the decision that we need to have a dedicated stakeholder forum for monographs. Um, so we will be establishing that. Um, and then I, I've mentioned infrastructure considerations in the GISC work, but we, we're also quite conscious that um, there may well be elements of um, infrastructure that, that we could help facilitate um, engagement with in terms of enhancing discovery of, um, of monographs or, or, or similar issues, um, looking at compliant routes, I suppose. Um, and we did actually undertake or, or funded a piece of work um, which looked at infrastructure considerations. So we'll be picking that up um, as part of that. In terms of our monitoring and evaluation process, um, we have just, I can say today, or in fact, the consultants don't know, but we have made the decision of who to appoint um, to develop the monitoring and evaluation framework for both the articles policy and um, the monographs policy. Um, and so again, there's a lot of co-design um, in that methodology. Um, and we will be able to at least um, announce the, the scope of the monitoring and evaluation framework um, in November 2022. Um, further information is coming out in July, another set of information in November, um, and then there are a few processes that we would seek to have finalised um, by March 2023, so that we're trying to be as in advance um, as we can. Um, so that is me. Um, thank you very much um, for listening. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was a really helpful introduction to the policy context um, that we're working under. Um, we've had a lively chat um, session in the in the text while you've been speaking with with a number of questions and i think the first one is is an amalgamation of two of those really um there's a there seems to be quite a bit of anxiety among um smaller institutions that ha nonetheless have research outputs and do do get ukri um, grants about how they can participate and the basic question is how do those institutions that don't normally have an OA block grant participate in ensuring the openness of their research monographic outputs under the policy? Thank you um, for that question. Um, so the, the block grant um, that is allocated only supports the research article policy. So the funds for the long form policy will be a centrally held fund. Um, and any institution will be able to have access to that fund. But the way in which that operates, we are still defining and we need to consider, um, consider that issue um, more fully. The, the, um, the way in which UKRI issues its funding is it doesn't issue direct to researchers, so it would be via research organisations. Um, and um, as far as um, we are concerned, it would be any research organisation. Um, what we've got to do is try and work out what the application process is. Um, and how to make that judgment so that it is fair and equitable um, and, and reasonable. Thank you. And I, I guess there's a, there's a follow up question to that, which is about um, second authors and you know the primacy of, of who applies. But you might not be able to answer that yet if the policy hasn't. No, been but, but, but I think we want to hear we want to hear about those issues. That's why I said this is really well timed. So yeah, a very good point. Thank you. So another question that's come through is um, from, from Katie Hughes at KCL, who asks, what should we be telling researchers now? Um, we've been getting questions from UKRI funded researchers who are negotiating their book contracts now for books to be published after January 2024. And they don't know if they need to opt for OA 
and if so, how they will pay for it. Um, some are working on collections and are looking at about £36,000 in BPCs, says Katie. I think that um, universities um, should use their discretion. Um, of course, we encourage open access, um, and but there's certain judgments that, that, that need to be made, and um, you can look at the policy and interpret it to your local environment. That's helpful. I suppose... Um, you can always think in... your grant, but, you know, that doesn't quite work. We recognise there's a little bit of lack of clarity here, but, yeah. I think the slides you showed earlier were quite helpful on this, though, um, particularly with the fact that if contracts are negotiated now, before then, they're not under the mandate necessarily. So um, there is a bit of leeway in the schedule to perhaps think about what you're telling researchers and and give, you know, reassuring them rather than scaring them at this point when we don't have all the details on paper is probably the way to go. <laughs> Sounds about right, Martin, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, just, I'm just trying to catch up with the chat here a little bit. Um, Dawn says, small universities without OA block grants already struggle with articles they're having to pay article processing charges for, so it's good to hear that it will be central um, with an application process. Um, small universities feel themselves being squeezed to meet the OA requirements for articles already and they, they don't want to see that replicated in the the monograph space so I think that sounds like it's a really welcome um, development. Um, does anyone want to come in and, and ask a question live? Um, if you want to put your hand up that is something that I, I believe you should be able to do um, otherwise it's just me, me trying to pick up things from the chat. Um, Nikki Clarkson does have another chat question though, which is, will there be guidance on what is a reasonable amount to pay for a book processing charge? I think that's going to be, you know, a consideration, yeah, we're, we're going to have to, but I, I really can't give um, an answer on that at this point in time. I know that um, in discussions that we've had with um, other funders that have similar funds, they have set limits. Um, they have also found it incredibly challenging to go beyond a BPC um, and find ways in which you can manage a fund which supports more innovative models. And we really want to support more innovative models. So we've got lots of questions to, to answer on that point. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Kevin says um, in the chat, um, and I see there's a hand up and I'll come, come to Chris in a, in a moment. Um, in terms of TAs, what are the future plans for changing conditions of TAs through JISC negotiation? As obviously the only for the corresponding first author in an institution and not any author means that either in case where our staff are not that corresponding author, they would not be able to publish them or be expected to continue to spend more money to comply, um, which doesn't give any of the flexibility or savings that transformative agreements were supposed to give on that basis the lower funding was given quite a complex um yeah very complex <laughs> and, and we we get a lot of questions and have had a lot of questions about the corresponding author um issue and i think karen has said in the chat that there is a, a round table um to to discuss that further um we've we've put some guidance in our faq as far as we can at the moment um but we recognize that the we need to look at um, further solutions, but Karen might want to come in on that. Yeah, Thank only you. to I... say that that timetable, uh, the, the round table is, is set up uh, with a prospective date for early July. And really we have to work through the solutions. Um, so we'll have representatives from the sector alongside representatives from the publishing sector to look at the possible solutions, recognizing that ensuring the ongoing affordability to institutions is absolutely integral to any solution that's put in place. Thank you, Karen, for that. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, just go to Chris and then Isabel, I said, and I'm going to then have to cut this short as we move to the next section. But Chris. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, thanks Rachel. That was, that was really interesting. Um, to pick back up on uh, the, the question about uh, those authors who are seeking to understand what they should do now, I think it would probably be really helpful to understand what the timeline for the um, advice and decision-making on the application process will be, because I what I'm seeing, uh, and I'm sure there are some authors on this call, what I'm seeing is 
the uh, authors who have long been advocates of open access and who have welcomed the policy and who have welcomed the fact that funding will be centrally held are keen that their work can be made open access. And there's a sort of bit of a policy or a, a, an information vacuum at the moment, which is causing them and by association us some frustration around what options are open to them given sometimes some of the large sums involved. So I wonder if there's, there's some guidance on, on at least a timeline that we might have in mind for that. Yeah, so I, I, I can't, I try to give some, um, which is, you know, we, we will say as much as we can in November, but some things will not be finalized until March, 2023. So, um, however, um, there's, Oh, well, I think that's probably as much, but what I will say, Chris, is we definitely want to have a timeline out there in July. So if we can schedule that on our website, <laughs> then there will be a timeline um, and, and to try and make as much material available. So, yeah, I recognise that and um, thank you for pressing us. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, there are there are a number of questions actually that, that alongside Chris is there asking about um, you know what what should we say what are the timelines but I think you've you've given some guidance on that now that's really helpful so thank you um, Rachel that's been really helpful and I'm really grateful to you for coming today thank you so much for your time um, obviously we're looking forward to hearing about the next stages and and where we go from here. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you very much again um, and virtual virtual applause. Um, <laughs> thank you. And I just want to say again, thank you so much. It is great timing. And I'm going to stay for the whole thing because we really want to know um, what's going on and make sure because we, as I say, we are moving on to this phase. So thank you so much. And I'm sorry that we don't have all the answers yet. Brilliant. Thank you. And I now I get to hand back over to David, I think, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, great, great uh, start to the uh, to the afternoon and, uh, and and a wonderful piece of scene setting. So we, we we know what we're aiming towards, and we know the challenges that are um, uh, in, in, in involved in in that. Uh, next, we're going to um, um, turn to Karen Malloy, who we've, we've heard from a little bit, but we'll give the floor to, uh, who's going to talk about just collections and, and the funding landscape. Uh, what Karen doesn't know about funding for journals and 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 books is is can be written on on on, on a very small postage stamp. Um, she's uh, she's one of the, the the international experts in this area. Uh, has worked for for JISC for um, many years now and has been instrumental in in many of the negotiations with publishers for all, for a variety of content. So Karen, we'll um, hand over to you. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you very much for, for having me along today and um, that very generous introduction, David. Um, I have been at GIST for 20 years and in those 20 years I have um, worked in the field of open access monographs. In fact, back in 10 years ago, 2012, I was um, leading the OAPEN UK open access monograph project. So I do have um, a background understanding in many of the challenges, frustrations, and um, pain points that come alongside a transition to open access monographs. But I also have the view of where possibly some of those solutions might be and the learning that, I, that we at GIST can apply from the work that we've done on the journal space as well. Um, so I'm going to uh, today talk to you a little bit about the funding landscape and how GISC is working to support institutions our members in that transition to open access and in the implementation of the open access monograph uh, policy. I do have my colleagues, uh, Graham Stone, who many of you will know, and Caroline McKay on the line as well. Um, so if you have questions, they may well pick those up as we go along. So our goals at JISC are really to help you sort of to prepare for the policy. So it's really interesting to hear some of those questions coming through about how do we prepare, what is the information that we need to provide to authors, and really engaging with you to think through what is the guidance and support that you need to put in place um, to ensure that your authors have clarity over the processes and also to then feedback some of that to UKRI to help them inform the development of how that um, 
open access monograph uh, funding pot is going to be made available and the conditions upon which it, it applies. And that's quite similar to the work that we've done as well in the journal space where we've worked with Wellcome Trust, UKRI, and um, we're currently working with NIHR to think about how their funds um, are being applied and the conditions that can be used with those. So we're also um, obviously really focused on putting in place those affordable and sustainable routes for publishing. Um, and that's really important. Well, what's really important for us and for uh, our members, as we hear, is really supporting that bibliodiversity and creating a dynamic environment where open access monographs can be published, but also providing that balance into the marketplace, um, which means that we really need to drive and support many of the community led initiatives that we see uh, being developed at the moment. We want to make it as easy as possible for authors and their institutions to understand um, which publishers are going to be uh, offering compliant routes and then also to actually find those open access monographs or the chapters or those edited collections once they've been made openly available and the current um, process and systems that are in place within publishing houses which are all set up to sell and um, make that slightly more challenging than you would imagine. And a lot of that's about getting the right metadata flows in place and ensuring that that is um, findable in our various uh, catalogues and solutions that we have within institutions and also within um, Library Hub. We also want to try and reduce that administrative burden for authors and institutions by undertaking uh, much of the data collection as possible. Um, so again, mirroring some of the activity that we undertake on the journal side, collecting data from uh, the publishers and presses that are providing open access monographs, helping us to verify and evaluate that data to support monitoring, reporting, and also to really help us to understand the performance of different types of agreements or what actually a reasonable BPC would be, which is something that, that was mentioned earlier. And it is by having the data behind agreements and behind uptake usage, number of uh, monographs or, or chapters being published and the costs of, that go into that, that we can then think about what the reason, what reasonable and affordable means for our sector. And lastly, we want to continue to engage with our international partners to support the alignment and interoperability of infrastructure and policies. Um, there is absolutely, you know, it's absolutely clear that in order for open access monograph publishing to be affordable and sustainable, we have to do this with our international partners to ensure that that infrastructure is there and that there is some policy alignment, given that UKRI is just one of the funders in this particular space. Um, and we have many other funders um, providing, uh, you know, where, where titles are being published from, from Lever Hume, etc. So um, it's no secret that um, in order to support that diversity in the marketplace, it's really important that we don't go down a single model um, and that we really think about what the book processing charge model means for the market um, and think about finding balance in the marketplace and supporting those alternative models, particularly with the, the high cost of book processing charges in many cases. Um, and uh, the, the affordability for institutions. So we really have been saying for quite some time and um, working in this field since 2012, as I, as I said, to really support and ensure that we are harnessing a number of initiatives, exploring a variety of different business models um, and not just going down one route, which is the book processing charge. In just licensing, um, we have a number of uh, licensing agreements uh, already in place and as I said we're really trying to support those community driven initiatives or initiatives which are um, really looking at how we can collectively support the availability of open access titles. Um, so we have supporter memberships with Pumpton Books and Open Book Publishers, we have models where the fees support um, the new front list content being made available with MIT Press and there's the Opening the Future initiative um, with uh, CUP and Liverpool University Press participating in that. We have an initiative with um, University of Michigan Press, De Gruyter, and most recently we've um, run an open access community framework and we've got 
um, several submissions uh, for that framework. Um, one from Open Up, which is six uh, UK presses, um, university presses. We've got the University of Westminster Press, University of London Press, and White Rose University Press. So you can see from the types of agreements that we're currently putting in place that we are really focusing in on supporting that diversity and really thinking about affordable routes to ensure that authors have access to um, compliant options. And with many of these agreements, um, there is actually quite a modest fee that's being applied. Um, and often that is less than what one book um, processing charge would be for a, a title with one of the, the larger publishers, for example. So it does look like this is a um, that these models are very viable um, and that there is great opportunity for us to consider how we take these forward and think about what the long term view of that is by working very closely with our members. This just gives you a sense of participation in our current agreements. Um, so of the, um, I think there's seven included here in this slide, of the seven agreements we've included in this slide, we have um, 104 subscriptions in total and we have participation from uh, 54 institutions. So there's 54 institutions participating in at least one of those agreements. And that's really encouraging to see that spread across the bands, actually. So representing from the very research intensive to the smaller specialist institutions and seeing that there is active interest and support for these types of models and initiatives. However, when we look at the, the number of subscriptions, we can see that it's quite variable across the board for those um, different models. And sometimes it can be quite low. Some of them are quite new, that might be why, but also in many cases, they've been around for a while, but the level of participation um, is quite low still. And that really speaks to one of the challenges that institutions and in particularly the library have in trying to get the support and um, to transfer budgets to support open access publishing uh, initiatives in the, in the monograph space. And often what we see is that these, uh, when the participation of the subscriptions come through, it's often an end of year decision um, based on, on remaining budget. And what we'd like to do is to work with our members to try and increase the number of institutions participating in these um, agreements and to try and work with them to really sort of share best practice and guidance about how to initiate with that within your institution. What does that mean for your local uh, library budgets where the bulk of this funding is coming from, but also to get that very uh, senior high level support for these types of initiatives understanding that if we are to succeed in this space of open access monographs, it's really important that we do have that diversity, particularly given the, the breadth of publishers in arts and humanities as well. So we have been uh, doing some blogs and uh, we've run some sessions recently and um, we have been sharing the advice and guidance that's coming through to from our members. So sort of learning from each other, um, and sharing practice, best practice and advice. And that's really important to encouraging that uptake um, and really uh, important to ensuring that we as a community are getting that balance in the marketplace. Um, so this is a quote from uh, Suzanne at uh, Sussex. And she's saying, you know, just how important it is that we support that plethora of models um, and that we ensure that we put those affordable models in place. And then just two more from our recent open access community framework event, which is all about supporting those diamond based community models. Um, so we've got Peter Barr from Sheffield and also um, Scott Taylor at University of Manchester, just talking about how they actually took the approach to um, internally to get that support and buy in for um, pushing forward with open access monographs and these these um, these more community diamond based models. But it's obviously not all about just the monograph as a whole. We've got edited collections and we've got book chapters. And we recognise that book chapters is an important area for the UKRI policy. Um, we believe um, that there are, uh, from the REF data from 2014, which I think Simon Tanner an analysed, there are far more book chapters than there are books. And so it's really important that we are working with the community to try and, and publishers, obviously, to look at what the viable routes will be for those open access book chapters. Um, 
again, introducing uh, what you might call CPCs, you know, there's all these acronyms, uh, that will be problematic potentially due to the cost. And therefore, we believe that piloting green routes for author accepted manuscripts for chapters is going to be something that we uh, take forward. And we are looking to set up pilots with publishers and presses to explore um, the viability of these models um, and uh, to really learn from them and share our findings with, with our member institutions and publishers. Um, in addition, we'll obviously be looking at the metadata requirements for book chapters, thinking about how the information around those chapters flows through our systems and to try and make it as efficient as possible efficient as possible that those uh, that that metadata is surfaced in the relevant services or in the relevant reporting for for this particular space. So in the field of sort of licensing in those those negotiations work that we undertake and in just licensing, we will be working with our University UK just content negotiation strategy group. Um, for the last two meetings, we've been talking um, about open access monographs. In fact, Martin came and presented at our last uh, uh, meeting and we are revising our strategic objectives, which will be discussed next week um, to ensure that we are incorporating open access monographs and really thinking through um, in the future what the sector's requirements will be for open access monographs, chapters and edited collections. We'll also be thinking through the negotiation strategies. Um, you'll note that we don't have a big uh, agreement in place, uh, uh, open access monograph in agreements in place with some of the bigger publishers. Um, and that is, uh, that is on purpose because we believe we need to ensure that we understand what your requirements are for those agreements before we put them in place. And we really think about what the negotiation strategies are for that. And we do that in collaboration with you. We'll also be uh, scaling up our engagement um, with publishers, presses, and obviously the negotiation of then putting in place compliant options or um, uh, open access arrangements with those particular uh, publishers. We are going to be analysing uh, the ref data, the last round of ref data to get a sense of the scale. We know when we uh, look at the funding being provided to publishers from UKRI on the journal side of things. We've scaled our agreements by a further, you know, the, the negotiations and discussions we're having have scaled by a further 380 odd publishers. So we imagine that we will see some of the same publishers there, but also some uh, very different publishers that really reflect that diversity in, um, in the arts and humanities space and, and social sciences as well. Um, and of course, we will be continuing to support the work that we do, uh, and I say we very loosely, it's mainly Graham, uh, in the space of community led publishing. So working with those new university presses, the new university uh, press collaborations like White Rose, for example, um, really working with them to ensure that they are a uh, they remain a viable and offer um, a sustainable route to open access monograph publishing for our members as well. I'm just going to uh, briefly touch on some of the other areas that we are working on, uh, either as part of the UKRI uh, funding that we've been provided or as part of a, a ongoing work at DISC. But the infrastructure that supports open access is really, really important, particularly open access monographs. Um, there was the UKRI gap analysis of open access monographs infrastructure. And so the work that we are doing to um, either expand or develop or look at uh, existing GIF services and how they can be enhanced to support open access books and chapters um, and also we'll be really uh, taking forward those uh, conversations with some of those emerging infrastructures to ensure that we get that real joined up approach that interoperable approach across those infrastructures so that means you know we'll be continuing to work with OAPEN, DOAB um, and looking at some of the the other international initiatives and um, COPIN and um, and uh, uh, operas as well. Um, we'll also be ensuring to uh, really thinking about how to make it easier for authors um, by re and reducing that bureaucracy, which we know is a, a really important factor uh, in making an efficient process and supporting a policy implementation. Um, so some of the areas, as, again, you know, really thinking about whether we expand or how we might expand um, 
the, the access to understanding where the compliant routes are for authors. So that could potentially be an enhancement to the Sherpa services, um, really thinking about how um, we then find the monographs that are made available and those chapters as well, potentially again an expansion with, with Library Hub to ensure that the metadata and that, that information is being shared across systems. Um, and of course, really um, supporting our members um, by trying to really think through the data side of things, how we can take on some of that um, data burden in terms of monitoring and policy compliance and reporting and provide that centrally on behalf of our members to UKRI, for example, um, potentially using our services such as Monitor. Of course, um, I started by saying that, you know, we've we've really been thinking about how we um, support some of your challenges. So it's really good. And this, as Rachel said, this session is a really good opportunity to hear about some of the challenges or some of the concerns that you have right now that we can actually just crack on and start working on with you to, to provide some more guidance or even just supporting that sharing of practice. And we do actually have a, a UKRI community of practice site um, that I do recommend you join and um, that really helps you share learning across institutions, which I think is what is, is often very helpful to thinking through what you are saying to your authors as well. Um, but we will be undertaking, um, <clears throat> sorry, high level briefings <clears throat> and workshops over the next couple of years. Excuse me, I'll have a bit of water. <clears throat> and um, planning some sessions around myth-busting webinars for, for, for authors, um, really thinking through those copyright and uh, some of the challenges there, supporting toolkits, and um, continuing to work with publishers, learning societies, um, institutional publishers, really um, working through and supporting that dynamic publishing environment. Um, so this is just uh, some of the things that we, we have either available um, or that we're working on and um, some of the sessions that will be uh, coming up in the future, including some of the roundtable events for publishers and institutions. And lastly, I think within my last minute, I just wanted to note that DISC will continue to work internationally. Um, again, I've, you know, the success of open access monographs is really linked into that wide engagement and support for sustainable infrastructure at that global level. And we will continue to participate in some of um, the international initiatives and work very closely and collaborate very closely with our colleagues. And of course, you know, COPIM is one of those initiatives that we participate in. So we're very um, pleased to, to see this event being taken forward as a good opportunity for us to think about how we are building that really um, strong, affordable, sustainable, open access uh, monograph publishing space. And I shall stop there. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Karen. That was that was absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, change things up a bit and take over on the, the Q&A uh, instead of Martin and, and David, just to make it a bit more varied. But yeah, I thought that was a really interesting presentation and uh, with loads and loads of stuff in it. So I really hope we can share the slides with everyone afterwards. Um, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, I'll speak to, uh, to Melanie and David about that after this. Um, but what's been really interesting for me actually is to see how joined up today's session already seems to be. Um, perhaps by, more by good luck than good management. I don't know. But anyway, what, what I mean by that is that, um, you've touched on so much there that I know I'm almost sure Martin will be talking about. and I'm almost sure Sarah and Simon from the libraries will be talking about, which so it's, um, it's great to see how um, embedded JISC really are in, in the, the real issues. So um, it's on me to, to just pull together a few of the, the questions that popped up in the chat. Your, your colleagues, uh, Graham and, and so forth, have been jumping in and fighting the good fight for you, Karen. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and pick out a few that weren't answer, answered. Um, a really good one from Isabel at Cambridge, who, who noted about we need to reflect on the diversity of the research community. Um, she's noted that established researchers with tenure appear to be more open to OA and alternative publishers. Can you talk a little bit about what support there is for ECRs who need to build their CVs and are perhaps uh, more concerned with the reputation of a publisher? That's a really a really good question, and that is obviously across the journal side and on the the monograph side. Um, I have to say, I've, I've often found that um, in in previous research that we've undertaken, 
that the early career researchers are much more um, open to the idea of publishing, but it is, of course, uh, linked into that career progression um, and the in, and uh, thinking about their um, their um, CVs, etc. So, um, yeah, it's a really good question. We we um, recognise the need to engage with early career researchers, really thinking about how we can bring them in and support them through the publishing experience and to develop um, that confidence. Uh, and that goes hand in hand with developing confidence in the research uh, culture within institutions as well. And that is a one of the strategic objectives of the content negotiation strategy group that they're going to be agreeing. So I do anticipate more coming through um, around that particular space, but I shall uh, just leave it there at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you. That's, a, that's great. Um, another interesting question that popped up, I thought, was from um, Alex at Bristol, who asked, uh, well, mentions that Bristol have a university press that charges BPCs. Um, could you talk a little bit about what support is out there to move presses like that to something? Well, Alex has said better. Uh, uh, yeah. What support might be there to move a press away from BPCs? I think it's about um, looking at the variety of models. So um, as we speak to the to the range of publishers in this in this space and the presses, um, it's really about exploring and showing, OK, if you look at your profile of how you have published in the past or what you have been published and your scale of your activity, that also maps to how this uh, press is using this type of uh, community based model. So to encourage them to under like to sort of compare and contrast the different types of models and to see that okay this might actually be a viable option for us um, and also I think there's going to be some or I hope uh, when I speak with my uh, with the content negotiation strategy group I think there's going to be some uh, recognition in the sector's requirements that book processing charges in the long run will not be a viable solution or not that will not be a viable a sustainable solution if it is the only solution so I do think there will obviously be some publishers that go down that route but we want to be pushing in and stressing as a sector I think um, the the need for those alternative models and that hopefully will come through when we talk to you all about your requirements for for open access monograph agreements. Great thank you thank you Karen um, I think we've probably got time for maybe one or two more questions um, I quite like this this late entry from Catherine at UCL, who boldly asks, is it too early to ask whether JISC and UKRI anticipate transformative uh, agreement like agreements with commercial book publishers? Uh, sorry uh, to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, Catherine. Um, I, I, my honest answer is I don't know yet as to whether that would be something that we would want to go down uh, in terms of, of a model for for monographs um it's not out of scope at the moment but i think understanding what good looks like in the future is going to be critical to, to looking at whether we we do ta like agreements but yeah everything is in is in scope but we want to make sure we're getting the right type of agreements in place for monographs sure well, I noticed briefly, rachel uh, raised a hand would you like yeah, to speak very, very briefly just to say that we have had publishers approach with ideas about models around that space but you know obviously taking into account whether that's good value whether it really is going to achieve um i suppose the the principles that we've already sort of got set out in terms of negotiations for the sector are, are the things that we need to check against super thank you um i'm mindful of the time but i think we could just i can see isabel has a, a hand up isabel at oxford not cambridge <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Karen. Very interesting. Um, we're still finding our feet like everybody else, presumably. And um, this is sort of a half formed question in my mind. But one of the questions or things that we are thinking about is um, assessing the content in those deals. And I'm just curious how those are going to interface, how an open access um, agreement is going to interface with the EBA ebook deals that libraries also have with the publishers, um, which are also kind of the new current current content that you're going to be getting. And it's, it's really unclear in my mind how this is all going to pan out in future and where you potentially end up with duplicate content. Are there any kind of thoughts about this that you might want to share with us if you have any? <laughs> I, I do. I don't know if they're fully formed thoughts, uh, Isabel. Um, um, 
but yeah, we are entirely conscious of the fact that we have a number of those sorts of agreements, EBA agreements in place, which support the, the availability of, of um, monographs. So I guess that links into Catherine's question around, you know, would we then be looking to transition those agreements into open access agreements using a similar sort of type of read and publish model? Um, and, you know, there are some publishers, as, as Rachel has said, that are interested in in that type of model um so i do you know i don't know if i have i don't really have the answer for you but we are fully aware of it and thinking about the interplay and that will lead into those conversations that we have with our strategy groups around the negotiation strategies looking at that broader landscape thank you okay i think we've probably grilled you enough karen you've done very well there thank you ever so much um Thank you. Real terrific Q&A and terrific presentation. Um, I think I'll just hand straight over to Martin now, um, or David's probably going to introduce Martin, and, um, and Martin will do his, his talkie. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Tom. I, yes, I, I could introduce Martin. I mean, I suddenly realised that we've seen Martin already and we haven't actually bothered to in introduce him. So apologies for that. I, I could play the you all know who Martin is anyway card, but that would be perhaps a bit rude. Uh, just to say Martin's Professor of Literature, Technology and Publishing at Birkbeck at the, the University of London, but he also has a very deep interest in issues around open access and has been thinking seriously about these issues for many, uh, many years now and has appeared on many committees, uh, helped to write reports, um, uh, appeared before the House of Commons Select Committee on, on, on open access and, 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 and such like and is an acknowledged uh, expert in in this area he also does the, the the thing that perhaps not everybody does in this field which is that he publishes in open access and he has a, a wide range of uh, monographs which you are able to get access to um, for free right now uh, through the fact that uh, martin uh, practices what he preaches uh, martin over to you thanks very much david um, and everyone for being here today so i'm going to talk today a little bit about how we get from where we are to a more systematic landscape of open access. We've heard discourses for many years now of the need for experiment, and I think we are still in a period where we need to experiment, and we should acknowledge that we don't have all the answers yet, and certainly that's coming through in, in the questions. We don't know what we should be saying quite to researchers yet. Um, we don't know which models are going to prevail and so on. But I think we also need to start thinking about how we get from the current landscape of experiments to something that is normalized, routinized, and part of what we do. Um, if we don't have a plan for what we do at the end of experiments and how we appraise whether experiments have worked, we just end up in a period of perpetual experiment. And that leads to discourses that legitimate endless stalling and never, never getting ahead with this. By way of background, I just wanted to note that I'm here today representing the COPIN project, which is a 3.6 million pound funded initiative of Research England and the Arcadia Trust, uh, which is a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. And the goal of this project um, over its multi-year lifespan has been to bring together libraries, universities, OA book publishers, researchers and infrastructure providers to think through what's missing in the landscape for open access books at the moment. And that ranges from technological aspects. So we've built a system for metadata storage and dissemination called totes, for example, um, through to thinking about the business models landscape. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the opening the future model alongside others that we've been piloting as part of this. Uh, there's also a platform, the Open Book Collective forthcoming, that will have a range of the current initiatives lined up in a single space for libraries to easily uh, cross-evaluate and, and participate in. But essentially, the Coping Project has been set up to try to bridge some of the current gaps in the infrastructure, acknowledging that there are gaps in the infrastructure and acknowledging that we're just simply not as far on with book thinking as we were in the journal space. I think we've got somewhere with the project and, and have ended up closer. I wouldn't say we've, we've achieved everything yet, um, but do please check out the COPIM uh, website if you'd like to know more about the things that we're doing. So we've, we've heard about the UKRI review for project funded research, um, and that's really important. UKRI, as Rachel said, is an extremely significant funder 
of high quality research that's been through a peer review process and that has specific project funding attached. Um, we recognize that those outputs are very likely to be high quality because they've been through an aforementioned screening process. They've almost been pre-peer reviewed in some senses before the outputs are even um, written. The challenge though is that UKRI does not represent um, an enormous body of funded research in the humanities and social sciences compared to the total body of research, which is often conducted on institutional time funded by streams like QR that come from the UK's research excellence framework and its allocation measures. So a really important point to stress is that, yes, it's great to hear um, UKRI's plans. We also really need to hear what the REF review turns out and what the kind of level of harmonization is between uh, UKRI's project funding and REF. And it's very difficult to know how that works as a mechanism. Um, REF funds work uh, prospectively um, in a sense, but on the basis of assessing the work from the last cycle. So five years worth of work is assessed, a ranking is produced, funding is allocated for the next five years on a rolling basis. Um, how do we allocate within that future outputs that will be submitted for the next REF is one of the crucial questions. We don't know which books will necessarily be going into the REF ahead of time. And so it becomes a much messier process to uh, attach books to a specific funding stream when you start to think about REF rather than project funded research. Um, a recent paper that I wrote with several members of, of the speaking uh, contingent today estimated that if you wanted 75% of compliance with REF books, you're looking at approximately 19.2 million pounds of funding per year uh, on the basis of a, an average market rate book processing charge. Um, we didn't suggest the book processing charge was the way you should do that. Um, it was just a way of coming up with a figure to think about what level of funding would be necessary. Um, it's not clear where in REF that would come from. It's, it's great to hear that UKRI is centralizing the fund for books. That gets around a lot of problems. Um, would people be happy to see a, a similar central hypothecation for uh, REF policy if, if one came out? I think I also want to stress, though, this notion that book processing charges are problematic uh, they look as though they're really handy because they give you an accountable unit to which you have recourse. And when you're funding a project with a specific outcome attached to a specific book, it's very good to be able to say, well, that book costs this much to make open access and we have a book processing charge and it's directly attached. But we also know that these types of mechanisms concentrate costs on institutions in ways that become quickly very unaffordable. Um, research intensive institutions end up paying many, many more times than they were under a purchasing model, um, while those who benefit from the global collection of OA um, find themselves unable to contribute at even a single book level because it's more than, than they were paying in the first place. The money simply is not in the right places, even if it is in the system. Um, in the system is the phrase that's often banded around, but if it's not at the place where you need to pay, that's a problem and book processing charges tend towards that type of setup. What's encouraging though, is that we've seen over the past couple of years, the emergence of a, a strands of different models that are trying to think through new ways of, of funding open access monographs. These are the experiments to which I, I gestured at the start of this talk, and they're the experiments which Karen has already very helpfully um, pointed us uh, with her presentation. And these mostly take the form of various types of either threshold or library membership models. And they can be categorized broadly to some extent by the size of the presses involved. Uh, there's probably some unfair categorization going on here in the name of oversimplification, but I'm gonna try just to talk through a little bit of what this landscape looks like so people can get a flavor for some of the new, newly emergent models. Um, I should say that lots of this came initially out of the scholar-led uh, open access presses where uh, scholars who are frustrated by the lack of progress in open access have set up their own presses um, and quickly found that book processing charges are not good models for what they do. So um, the aforementioned open book publishers and Punctum Books, for example, have membership schemes to, in which libraries can participate. 
And that's not to fund any one specific title to be open access. It's to fund the ongoing operations of the press to have editorial independence, to select titles to publish, but to have then the revenue in place that they're not reliant on uh, a pure economy of paywalled or gated sales for what they do. And they can just make the material open access without worrying about having to hit the revenue threshold. And that can sometimes be balanced against sales as well. So various studies have shown that you do still see sales in an open access monograph environment. It's not as though sales all disappear overnight and you have no revenue from sales. So you get this mixed economy model of a membership um, to support this coupled with uh, more conventional sales like approaches. Um, at the other end of the scale, you have some quite large and very well known presses who have implemented different models for how they can get to open access without book processing charges. Um, MIT uh, very prominently launched its direct to open scheme in the last couple of years, which is a subscription threshold system where if enough people subscribe to the front list in any one year, they'll make the entire front list openly accessible or even just a part of the front list openly accessible. Uh, Cambridge University Press has a pilot called Flip It Open, I think it's called Flip to Open, um, where on an individual book level, there's a threshold set for a, a revenue projection. And if that threshold is reached, the title is made openly accessible. So the books that meet their expectations for revenue become open. Um, that's an interesting one, because obviously the challenge there is that you are funding the books that are most uh, widely purchased and used to be, be open access, whereas the ones that are perhaps not getting those sales are the ones that might benefit from the additional exposure of open access. And so there are a set of mixed motivations in there that become quite complex and difficult to juggle quickly. Um, Michigan has a program called Fund to Mission as well, uh, which is designed to um, showcase the press's alignment as they see it with uh, institutional libraries, um, and their desire to move to open access. And again, a threshold that if they can get to their target, they can make books from their front list that year openly accessible. What I've been doing um, with Tom at COPIM is working with small to medium sized academic presses with substantial backlists to try to work out what we do for those presses that don't fit um, within those two poles of size and who also need very low risk models for a transition to open access because they, they're not operating on huge margins that would allow them to take enormous financial risks. Um, so we've been working particularly with Liverpool University Press and the Central European University Press to build a model called Opening the Future. Um, the basic idea behind Opening the Future is that libraries subscribe to the backlist of titles at the press. So Central European University Press, for instance, has sets of 50 books in packages that you can subscribe to as a library. And that, that's a subscription. It's not open access in any way. But what the press does is that it uses the revenue from that backlist subscription to build a fund to open books in the front list progressively. So as the press gets to the next um, revenue threshold that it would need for an open access book from your subscription to the backlist, they'll make another front list title openly accessible. And in that way, what we're trying to do is to build this kind of melioristic improvement program where book by book, we gradually unlock the front list of titles rather than saying it's an all or nothing uh, on the front list where either you get there or you don't. Um, and that's been going pretty well so far. We're, we're getting well towards our targets to um, convert uh, the front list at Central European University Press and a series at Liverpool University Press to, to this model. And as I said, in that model, we try to get this kind of uh, orange segment diagram going where it's it's a book by book and we can be transparent about what we're doing with the revenue. So we've got this discourse of experiments. We've got, say, these three strata of sizes of press trying things. Um, what does it look like on the ground? Are people participating? Are we getting somewhere where these experiments are yielding results that give us some confidence about what the future should be and what it looks like? Um, it's a mixed bag, I'd say. The challenge of COVID-19 was enormous for library budgets. Um, the uncertainty that was engendered by that uh, hugely influential event on student recruitment and just not knowing for that year long period in particular what 
revenues were going to look like at UK institutions in particular, which are particularly susceptible to fluctuations in revenue from student recruitment dips. We also had the challenge that um, during the last couple of years, the student numbers cap in UK institutions has been lifted, which has given greater financial uncertainty and a greater division between institutions where larger institutions have felt more certain in their revenue projections, even while smaller institutions have started to really feel the pinch. So participation is perhaps uneven between different types of institution according to their ability to participate and their projected risk from the pandemic due to student recruitment fluctuations. The challenge is that we need participation in experiments and it's not enough for people to sit back and say, um, we're gonna see what happens. Because if people don't participate and they sit back and see what happens, the experiments fail because everyone just watched and waited. There has also been a little bit of a discourse in recent days about um, the legibility of the landscape and the complexity of trying to understand a variety of different models. I mean, one of the good things actually is that there aren't that many models for open access monographs. Um, some of them have some complexities. You know, I had to explain opening the future and take care around you know, the relationship of the backlist, the front list, and it, it does take a little bit of understanding. But I think we're actually at a point where at the moment, there are few enough models that we can get people to understand these and we can get outcomes from experiments. As Karen said, the experiments are also very affordable. Uh, those models that try to distribute costs through membership models are less than a single book processing charge by a long way. In many cases, they're less than an article processing charge in the natural sciences. And I think that affordability premise is absolutely key because we know that the humanities and social sciences where the long form output is so core are not well funded by comparison uh, with their scientific cousins. But we also need to think about, as I said, this long-term transition and when we, where we get from the models that work to as experiments to the models that work as long-term uh, acquisitions, budgets, replacements. And one of the things to do that that we need to think about is how we appraise investment. Um, I'm really pleased that we've got um, Tasha Mellons Cohen from Counter going to talk just later about open access book metrics. But we need to think about how libraries decide where to put their acquisitions budgets and how that translates into open access. So one of the points is that those, those teaching centric institutions have local teaching need as a core premise for what they're doing. It can sometimes be then very hard for them to see how a book processing charge model translates into something that's that's useful when local teaching need is your core reason for buying books. However, if you think of open access as building a global collection once for everyone, suddenly that local teaching need is met by open access when you've got a central pool of titles on which you can call. Other institutions are thinking about local research environment and open access and what they can do, say, for future ref environment statements to make themselves um, appear as though they are, well, to show that they are embracing open science and open research practices. Um, supporting experiments in open access monograph publishing is certainly one thing that can um, look quite good on those forms, but it needs to be incorporated as part of a longer term strategy. And lastly, I just wanted to stress that. Uh, we've got to be careful about comparing book metrics with journal usage metrics. We know we have a much longer half-life on these titles. We know that the way that they influence disciplines is difficult. It's not sheer numbers of eyeballs on a page that makes a difference. It's actually how, narratively speaking, disciplines are affected by a publication and its significance and how that can take a very long time to filter through. And so I think we need to be cautious around resisting the, the move to pure metrification of how we appraise where we're putting our money and what what titles are used in that quantitative sense. So my last slide before we go to questions. We've had this several times today already, but the acquisitions budget at institutions needs to change if we're to see a transition to open access monographs. Um, we can't have open access monographs just being an additional cost on top of the acquisitions budget that would not meet the affordability criteria under which we're operating. The good news is that lots of the experimental models that are coming through have acquisitions like components. So 
opening the future, for instance, you do buy something directly for your own library. The subscription premise of direct to open even, for example, is a direct purchase for the library because if they don't make the threshold, you have access to that front list. And so there are ways in which already you can narrativize participation in experiments through uh, the acquisitions budget. I think we should take care of our metrics, as I said on my last slide, but I also want to say that it's, it's heartening to see so many people from the library community here today because library leadership is key. And we're gonna hear later from two libraries that have been leading on this about what their practices look like and, and what they've been doing to try to make this more of a reality. So thank you very much. If you have any questions afterwards, do please stay in touch. Um, you can write to me at martin.eve at bbk.ac.uk. Um, there's the COPIM website there, um, COPIM.ac.uk, um, and other uh, useful links like openingthefuture.net. Thank you very much, and looking forward to some Q&As. Uh, thank you, Martin. That was uh, superb. And I think the issues that you, you raised about how we make that shift from experimentation through to, to, to business as usual, how we think about appraising our investments and then, and then how we think about how we operate with, with acquisitions is, is, is really interesting. I think that, um, I think that people were, were um, concentrating so carefully that they haven't really had much chance yet to, to put in questions. One has just come in, but while, before I, I turn to that, one thing that struck me, I mean, I, I was thinking about some of these, these, these flipping models and the, um, you know, the, the subscription aspects to it. And I'm wondering if there's a danger there that they might fall foul of the policy because with all of these, with all of these sort of subscribe to open type models, the assumption and the hope is that the, the material will, will become open access, but there's always going to be a danger that it might not. And if you're an author who is under the UKRI's policy, do you, is that a risk that you would be willing to take? And so I wonder if there's something about the way that the policy is set up that would discriminate against those types of models. Although to partially try and answer my own question, I guess there's always the possibility that you could you could put a, an author accepted manuscript in, but maybe won't want to do that. But I, I don't know, have you got some thoughts? So I think this is a basic question about accountability and funding and how outputs are linked to particular funding streams or otherwise. Um, if we think about a, a broader environment of REF where we, we don't have a specific knowledge about a specific output being open access, but we know that it's likely that we want it to be open access because the REF policy says so, we need an environment where essentially we have converted the vast majority of, of front lists at the vast majority of presses that people want to publish with to an open access model. And we need to get there before the policies kick in. So for example, with our work with Central European University Press, the goal is to get the entire front list of research monographs to be openly accessible at that press so that any author who comes to that press doesn't even have to think about this. What we've done is we've made it possible for everything there to be openly accessible without the author thinking about it. Now, are we gonna reach that in time across all presses? I, I shouldn't think so. And that is where this risk starts to come in. Um, I wouldn't encourage anybody to violate their funding agreement with their funder. That would obviously be not a good thing to do. Um, but I suppose that's where things like the UKRI centrally held fund could be helpful. You know, if it turns out it's not covered by an existing flip of an entire press, then actually having having recourse to a book posting charge for that title could be really helpful. We, in fact, we do take a mixed model at Opening the Future where the press will accept a book posting charge if one is available, but that's kept as a separate revenue stream from the other titles that we're converting that don't have recourse to those funds. So I think if we can get these streams mixed in a way that doesn't overlap, I don't want to see people, people double dipping, but yeah. if we get it so that we're, we're trying to convert presses as holes via subscribe to open type principles, but we've got fallback to book processing charges in the cases where that doesn't work, we can think further about green and authors accepted manuscript as an even further fallback on that. We've actually got quite a variety of, of hopeful looking ways that we can achieve this. And, and that makes me feel quite hopeful about it. 
Um, brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, Philip Keats has has um, uh, put in a question about um, book budgets in smaller teaching focused institutions, uh, which are essentially spent on academic determined reading lists. And is there a role here for advocating uh, academics to use more open access materials in their reading lists um, to, to free up budgets for them to, to make more materials open access? I think there's a there's a really strong argument around it, thinking of of monographs as open educational resources in some senses and thinking about how we talk to students about this. Um, students end up paying quite a lot to buy books that they, they need to use. It's not often research monographs, it's not, not always at least, but you know, titles like companions, um, edited collections and so on, students do sometimes end up buying. If a core part of a, an institution's teaching offer is that actually, you know what, we, we ensure that the vast majority of texts that you will need to read will be available to you digitally in a convenient form that you can access at home without having to go to the library centrally. You know, this, this is a really powerful part of an institution's teaching offer, I think, that we should be capitalizing on. I also think that we, we end up thinking about you know, well, we need to get that book this year, so we'll subscribe to the book package for this year that gives us access to it. And then we end up subscribing to it next year again and again and again. And over time, we've ended up actually paying for the book multiple times in multiple ways. Going back to this idea of a central global OA collection for everyone is a really powerful way of centralizing this as let's buy it once for everybody and then we all benefit and start and think of the global collection as a shared pool could, could be a really useful thing for teaching as well as research. And I, I think I should say also, in, our, in the disciplines where these books really matter, there isn't that clear divide between that's just a research thing and that's just a teaching thing. We teach with the research materials and it's a core part of it. So these spaces overlap a lot more than we see in perhaps natural scientific disciplines. No, I think that's, I think that's true. Thank you. Um, the question uh, around that sort of move from experiment to, to um, uh, a more business as usual, I think, is is is, is underpinning a question from and uh, Samson at UCL here about um, some of these packages and the content that's within them, and 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 how whether or not libraries can get more involved and librarians can get more involved in choosing the the the, the, the books that are in the uh, in 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 included in the package i guess if i can add a gloss to that i think there's been a, a, a number of occasions where libraries have said well we're not entirely convinced this is these are the titles that we need or, or want but this is an interesting experiment and we want to support it so we'll do that but if we want to move from the experimentation then obviously we need to to, to get that sorry to anna if i'm if i'm sort of slightly hijacking her question there but um hopefully that gives the sense no, and I'll try and answer that in two parts. So I, th I think one part of Anna's question is how do we get more publishers on board? Um, as I said, I think the challenge is that the, the monograph publishing sector doesn't operate in the Elsevier realm of 37% profits for the most part. Um, on these titles, they're, they're not making enormous margins um, and certainly the more mission oriented ones are not, but they are still beholden to their institutions, their host institutions to ensure that they, they break even. So they need low risk models that allow them to, to try things and move forward step by step rather than jumping with both feet. And that's where projects like COPIM are really helpful. You know, we've had resource to go out to some presses and pilots and models. Um, we're producing a toolkit that we're going to put out in the next few weeks, I hope, if I finally get around to finish writing it, um, that says what we did. You know what it means on the ground as a publisher to go through this what resource you need to allocate to make it viable what the risks are what the benefits look like um we want to do a phase two of this work at copim as well and think about how we could bring some more publishers on board to show them these benefits and also show them that it's not just the first mover advantage that's getting getting this to work because that's that's the then worry is well, you made it work with two presses, but that's because there was all this attention. And as David said, you know, it's easy to um, get excited about those first experiments, but what do you do when it's more routinized? And then just quickly on the choosing the book front, it, you know, there has been some, some anxiety around our publishers in these experiments or even in their 
uh, more broader OA offerings, just giving the titles that we didn't want or didn't need. Um, it's really difficult, but you know we've worked very hard on that at Opening the Future to say, actually, we want to put the most impactful titles into the open access. And we, we've got a library committee together to tell us which titles they most wanted to be in the backlist collection. And then the frontlist titles are just made open access on the basis of the next one coming through. Yeah. And I think building trust by getting librarians in a room together to tell us what they want is actually quite useful. Um, and going forward, you know, that kind of community involvement seems a key part of the governance stakes. Um, for the future yeah and that partnership working i think is going to be it's going to be increasingly uh, important uh, so uh, there's a couple of questions that um i think have either been partially answered actually in the chat themselves or will we will come to um in the conversation i mean one uh, from from ian simpson is, is talking about how we persuade of higher higher ups in the institution to allow us to change acquisition budget models. Um, I think that our library colleagues after the break might talk about that a little bit, but I mean, is there, what's, what, what's your top tips for um, uh, what the, the levers that we can pull here for, um, for, for, for getting that, those shifts? I think there's, there's two levers. Um, the first is, well, the first is thing that libraries don't have to do, but it's something publishers have to do, which is to make, the new models for open access have an acquisitions component so that it's really easy for a library to say well that's what we're acquiring um you know we're not going to get every high level manager at every institution to sign up to the open research agenda tomorrow so i think that um in in the interim period what we need to do is to build models that that are congruent with what libraries expect to spend on um, the second thing, though, is that those policy conversations need to be happening at institutions. We need to articulate the strategic value of open access. We need to articulate what it does for teaching, for research um, in those two spaces and make it part of institutional thinking and planning. And also just thinking that if you look at the international landscape, it feels to me as though the US is, is ahead of us in the UK in many ways in the development of scholarly communications departments and librarian specialities. We are now seeing that in the UK. I'm not saying it's not there, but it's um, it's perhaps been slower here. And I think we'll probably see more of that over the next decade, which will then result in a budgetary transition as well. I think my reflection there, which I, 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 I do agree with you, but I wonder if partly it's, we're seeing those posts because uh, the, um, especially the larger universities are, are tend to be more uh, better funded so i think there's there's enthusiasm and interest within universities uh, here but not necessarily the specific posts um and, and so there, there may be you know uh, a, a slight difference there and i think that also that you know the that the the higher ups you know the, the 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 attitude is shifting so much i mean those of us like yourself martin who have been in open access advocacy for a long time I mean, the environment is very different uh, uh, now in terms of, you know, not perfect, but very different to as it was 15 years ago when, you know, people didn't even want to talk about some of these some of these issues, uh, apart from a one or two enthusiasts. But it, it is putting it in that open research uh, and, and open learning and teaching um, agenda uh, really picks that up. Um, there was a question about uh, impact and metrics from Joe, but I, I'm going to suggest that we, we carry that forward. Um, I so mangled Anna's um, um, question that she's now um, um, sort of like um, put some clarification in there. So, so thank you for that, Anna, and, and apologies for, for, for um, the fact that I, I, I didn't quite ask the right question there. Um, we're now on um, 22, uh, we wanted to um, have a, 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 a good break because we've had an intensive um, first session. Uh, we want to continue that conversation and those discussions um, after the break, but we wanted to give you all the chance to, to, to move away from the screen, uh, to perhaps um, stretch your, your legs. Um, I will, though, I'm just, um, um, I just noticed Isabel's question and, and asking Martin about how long um, we might it might take to get to a, a sustainable uh, the open book um, um, model. So I'm going to I'm going to give you the chance to answer that before before we break. 
oh god this is the kind of uh you know put your finger in the air and guess which way the wind's going question isn't it um it's it's always five years out um is, is as long as i've been looking at it but i think over the next 10 years we will see a substantial shift that is different to, to the previous decade is my feeling um and one of the things about that actually links to, to anna's point and question which is that more authors are asking about this at publishers um i i edit a book, book series at bloomsbury and it's now very common to get author questions often fueled by anxiety rather than enthusiasm i should say you know it's not not that people are really keen on it but they do say what can i do about making my book open access we don't have a great answer for them at that series at bloomsbury at the moment but it would be nice to think in the next decade we might and that is driving change because every time a publisher sees one of those questions they realize that it's not something that's just going to go away anymore so we've got an uh, interesting um, uh, second half of the uh, of the of, of the session. Uh, we're talking, going to be talking and picking up on the, some of the issues around metrics, which we've already um, touched on, and then looking at a uh, view from from a, a couple of libraries uh, to look at um, how the library world can um, adapt and change to this new environment. Uh, before we close. So it's a, a great pleasure to, <laughs> I just had a slight, slight panic, panic when you see your next uh, speaker heading for the door, but um, she's back, thankfully. Um, our, our speaker to start up uh, this uh, session is uh, Tasha Mans cohen uh, from Counter. Um, uh, Tasha is uh, the project uh, director at Counter and she's got over 20 years of experience in society, scholarly and commercial publishing. Uh, she's also been an independent publishing consultant. Uh, Tasha only joined um, Counter in April of, of this year, so it's a, perhaps a little bit unkind of her to, uh, unkind of us to expect her to be uh, about to solve all of our problems around metrics for open uh, access monographs, but I'm sure that she's up to that job. So Tasha, we'll, we'll um, ha hand over to you. Thank you, David. I, I have to say, I've only been employed by Counter since April, but I have been one of our volunteers since 2015. So I, I've got a little bit of experience there. Um, yes, I, sh I shut the door because I decided you probably didn't want to uh, hear the noise of somebody providing voiceover from next door. So uh, please bear with me and I will start my slides. And in the now traditional question, can everybody see my slides? Uh, they look perfect, that's great. Lovely, thank you. So usage data for OA monographs. Um, most people that I speak with tend to think about counter data as being the information that librarians use to evaluate subscription content. And I'm here to tell you that actually usage has a real role to play in showing uh, the value of open content, including open monographs. So I was going to start with the question, raise your hand if you think that usage data is relevant, but I've already told you that it is. So I'm going to skip this slide and move on to giving you my answer. Usage data is one of the suite of metrics that we can use to measure impact. And with enormous thanks to uh, the Economic and Social Research Council for this definition, which is far better than mine. Um, impact is a contribution that research makes to society and the economy. And two of the big factors that are driving the changes in scholarly communication are open access and the increasing demand for measuring impact. And that's coming from funders, it's coming from institutions, it's coming from researchers themselves, and of course it's coming from publishers. The problem is we all tend to mean slightly different things when we're discussing impact, but broadly speaking, it's going to fall into either the academic side, so that's research that moves forward our understanding of the world, or economic and societal impact. That's lovely, right? It's very fine sounding definition, but we are human, or at least I, I hope everybody here is human and we haven't seen the rise of the robots and I've missed it. And as such, we like to simplify complex matters. In the case of measuring impact, that's often boiled down to account of citations in the past, 
And that's a very direct measure of impact. It means that the work has been found and hopefully read and found useful by a scholar. Citations, however, are quite laggy. And in some fields, we can be talking about decades before they really start to accrue. So in recent years, we've added altmetrics to the mix. And that is typically going to be assessing social media and other online activity like blogs or inclusion in citation management tools. And the issue is that while those are very immediate compared with citations, altmetrics are often quite reflective of fleeting attention rather than lasting impact on scholarly practice. And let's be realistic, hands in the air, I've done it myself. A lot of people will retweet or share articles that they've never read. So that means that all metrics must be considered flawed. I argue, and a lot of my counter colleagues would argue, that usage metrics, and particularly the comparable consistent usage metrics produced by counter compliant platforms, are a third type of impact measure. And unlike citations, usage does accrue from the day of publication, while unlike all metrics, we can be sure that usage reflects some form of engagement with the original content. So yes, counter is still relevant in an OA world, including for OA monographs. Having said that, and I'm going to come back to this again and again, I want to be really clear that research assessment should be a holistic exercise. None of these metrics should be used on their own and none should be used without an appreciation of the scholarly merits of the work. So I'm sure the librarians in the audience will be very familiar with this calculation, your cost per use or cost per download calculation. And this is quite a helpful addition to the use of, of the use of usage, apologies, uh, for showing impact. Um, usage metrics can be part of a suite of metrics that show return on investment very directly by creating this cost per use calculation. So if you have funded open content, and we've been having a fabulous uh, Twitter string about the alphabeti spaghetti that is APC, BPC, CCC, CPC, all the rest of them, um, if you've invested in open content, you can divide the amount you've spent making a piece of content open, um, whether that's a book processing charge, a contribution to Knowledge Unlatched, funding for the Open Libraries of Humanities, or whatever it might be, by the total unique item requests for that piece of content. And you can then show whether you are getting good value for money compared with subscription content for making research openly available. Again, uh, this is not to say that usage and cost per use are the only metrics that apply, but I have been asked to focus on usage metrics. So, if we're going to measure usage for open access content, the traditional institution level counter reports are not particularly helpful. Open really does mean that we need to look globally. The Code of Practice released in 2017 included the concept of global usage metrics, which we, for some reason, called the world reports. And those global usage metrics are built up of attributed and non-attributed usage of content on publisher platforms. That is the usage that we can link to an institution, which is attributed, and that which we cannot link to an institution, which is non-attributed. Even for subscription content, many publishers report that a lot of usage, averaging about 80% when we asked last year, is not attributed usage. So it's hidden in institutional usage reports. And within the attribution split, whether content is paywalled or free to read or open access is a rather secondary question. Uh, what I will say specifically for this group is many publishers who are open access only will not have any mechanism to link usage to an institution. Um, typically, that would be IP recognition. And I know um, that Liblinks and PSI are offering a way to do that. But again, it's, it's only going to cover a, a small proportion of your usage. So really, total usage, global usage is the way to go. 
So we know we need to be tracking usage. We know we need to be tracking it at the global level. What does that actually mean for monographs? So in counter terms, we need monograph publishers to provide two reports. One is the platform report, which is the top line summary of all activity across an entire platform. And the second is the title report, which breaks that information down into metrics at the level of each book. And there are some preset filter views, including preset, presets within the title report for books specifically. Um, but really, once you've built the title report and the platform report, delivering the filters is fairly straightforward. Within those reports, you will find three flavors of usage metric. As I've already said, denials, turnaways are really not relevant to purely open access publishers as everybody can get usage access. And I'm sure you can guess what the search metrics are about, uh, so I'm not going to delve into those. I will, however, focus in on the investigations and requests because these can be a little confusing to people who've not come across them before. So an investigation highlights users engaging with metadata about a piece of content. So that could be a book blurb. It could be chapter titles. It could be the table of contents. By comparison, a request indicates that a user has accessed the full content record. Now that typically could be a chapter, but if you only deliver your books as a whole book, then it would be the book that would be the subject of the request. We've also then got the distinction for investigations and requests of whether we're looking at total investigations or unique. So total usage, what we're saying there is if a user accesses an article abstract five times in one session, that is five total item investigations, but it's only one unique investigation. And the reason that that is important is because it makes unique usage metrics comparable across publisher platforms and really does take account of those different user interfaces and, and deviations between experiences. And lastly, investigations and requests are delivered at different levels of granularity. At the title level, so for example, a book, and at the item level, so that would be a chapter. So a couple of key differences between books and journals or databases or, or other types of content. Firstly, Investigations and requests for monographs are usually lower than the usage metrics for journals. This is nothing new and it is nothing to worry about. Secondly, book usage often takes longer to accrue than journal usage um, in as much as it's got a longer half-life. It doesn't always take longer to accrue the first usage, but typically we'll see books accruing um, investigations and requests for far longer than a, a typical journal article. And thirdly, book usage can be rolled up from the item to the title. So we've, we've sort of said that here, the, the, the where is, is showing that. So that means if you're looking at a counter title report for a mixed content publisher, you will see total and unique item investigations for both books and journals but you'll see total and unique title investigations only for books. And that has some implications. If we consider a scenario where a user reads or downloads three chapters from two different books, that's going to show up in the title report as three unique item requests and two unique title requests. Whereas, if we have another scenario where a user reads or downloads five chapters, all from the same book, that's going to show up in the title report as five unique item requests, but only one unique title request. I would argue, and I would think many people here <laughs> agree with me, that that second scenario, the use of five chapters, reflects more usage. 
And that is the reason that Counter always recommends using unique item requests when evaluating usage. On the question of supply chain, um, I, I wasn't actually briefed to talk much about supply chain, but I do want to just raise here the question of disambiguating chapters or, or items from their parent titles. That is typically done using identifiers, so an ISBN for book and a DOI or an internal proprietary identifier for a chapter. Again, I would advocate for using persistent identifiers that are underpinned by open infrastructure rather than using internal proprietary IDs because that delivers maximum interoperability and traceability through the scholarly communication system. But very much takes me on to this word of warning. Global usage reports, when we talk about global usage reports, we are talking about usage on a specific platform. Counter reports are not currently aggregated across platforms. So what I'm saying is if you have a book in the Open Library of Humanities and it is replicated, for example, in JISC collections, their counter reports from those two different platforms will, will record the information about those books separately. If you have a DOI for each chapter, then librarians can start to aggregate the information across different platforms if they choose to do so. Now, I would love, and I have said this to my counter board, to start aggregating usage stats from every platform for every unique item. But as the JASP team from JISC will tell you, that is an awfully big task. It is much easier said than done. Um, I know that the Open Access Book Usage Data Trust is also looking at this kind of aggregation, and my predecessor, Lorraine, is involved with that project, and I am keeping abreast of what's going on there. But again, it's, it's quite a technical challenge to start aggregating data across multiple platforms. So, that is an incredibly basic introduction to the value, the reason for usage metrics, and specifically the reports and metrics relevant to books. I just want to reiterate that nobody within Counter thinks that Counter metrics should be used in isolation. Usage, just like other metrics, only shows a part of the picture when it comes to demonstrating that a book or any other research output has delivered on a funder's goals, on an institution's goals. So we always suggest using multiple data sources. And for me personally, I would love to see institutions combining cost per use calculations for the open content they've funded with the citations and alt metric information, as well as anything else you track. And obviously this is something that publishers should be doing as well. This is not purely an institutional responsibility. Beyond those metrics, there are downstream impacts of research outputs, like new research collaborations, either between departments that don't typically work together or with new third parties. There are new funding streams. And of course, there are patents and similar commercial activities. Those are a little bit less um, numerical, a little bit less fixed, but they are valuable to track. Um, so that's my plea. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm just going to put in a tiny plug. Um, as some of you know, counter release 5.1 is going to be coming up for consultation this year. And when I say this year, I mean next week. <laughs> so we've been massively, massively focused on facilitating open access reporting for release 5.1 of the code of practice. I would really love it if everybody who's on this call would be willing to respond to the consultation um, when they see it come out and also promote it to their colleagues because the more feedback we get the better and that is the end of my slides i hope i haven't bored everybody to tears i know usage metrics are not thrilling for everybody i i'm personally actually very excited tasha thank you for for that and helping us to think through the the role of of metrics and numbers in fields that are often more about qualitative narratives um, of 
of success and it's it's useful to know you know when people have to spend money how can they use these numbers to to help them and how's they use them responsibly to make those those decisions so yeah really really useful um we've got some questions coming in so uh, i'm really pleased to be able to relay those so um one of the first of those is what does platform mean in the context of oa monographs published by a university is it something like open monograph system or is it a university publications website or repository um, Both. <laughs> um it is the location where content can be used so a lot of content a lot of open access content in particular is available from multiple platforms um, multiple locations so institutional repositories absolutely count as a platform uh, as does things like the open monograph system we needed to come up with a sufficiently generic term to cover all the bases and platform was adopted i think back in 2010. And I, I wanted to follow up on that actually. Um, Crossref for many years now has had um, this idea of a, a landing DOI uh, that can point to multiple platforms of usage. Is that kind of permanent identifier, persistent identifier approach with a front landing page one way in which platform aggregation could start to happen? Yes, and actually we did do a project with the appallingly bad name of DAL standing for distributed usage logging um, that was a, a counter and crossref collaboration project. It, it's somewhat been parked uh, because the technology at the time just didn't really facilitate what we were trying to do. Um, but we're now several years further on and it's something that I do want to, to pick up and start exploring again. Thank you. Um, there's actually a, a further um, a follow up from, from that last question, mm -hmm. which was, can counter provide usage metrics by domain? Um, Google Analytics has stopped providing this information. Before we did that, we could report the .gov usage, the .edu US and various other excellent insights. Um, it seems libraries are looking for an alternative source of this data. So counter doesn't actually provide any reports itself we provide the standard and we audit or we we work with third party independent auditors to validate that publishers and and other report providers have effectively um, delivered on the standard we don't currently have an extension for reporting on domain uh, it's certainly something i would happily take to the technical advisory group uh, and it's certainly something because we do facilitate um, bespoke extensions. So every um, report provider, if they choose to, can provide extensions on the code of practice if that's something that their library customers want. So let me let me scribble that down. I am actually quite old fashioned. I write things down. Otherwise, I forget. Um, extension. Thank you. That's great. Actually, one of the things that we are um, considering, not for release 5.1, just because it, it's already quite big, uh, is whether counter should include the option to report on referral domain. So where people have come from before landing on a piece of content. It's not currently, not gonna happen for 5.1. It may happen in the future. That's great. Um, one of the uh, interesting points that the two people picked up on was you, you talked about alt metrics and the challenges of um, people retweeting uh, things they, they haven't read. Um, two, two commentators independently noted that people, people also cite, cite things they've articles not read. they haven't yes. read. Um, could you just say I something about, about that? Um, yes. Uh, so I am well aware that people cite things that they haven't read. Uh, I think it is, I hope it is slightly less common than tweeting things one hasn't read. Um, one of the frequent discussions with the technical group at Counter is 
the question of intent and whether it is possible for us to measure intent. So at one point uh, we've had a focus group with libraries where the librarians were asking us to only report requests where users have stayed on the full text of a piece of content for a certain amount of time, which I appreciate would show that somebody has actually potentially read in inverted commas a piece of content. Uh, but we then had the challenge of, well, what if they've downloaded a PDF? And they've just come into the article or the, the book chapter and downloaded the PDF and taken it away and they've read it offline. We, we have no way of measuring that. Um, so counter cannot measure intent. We can only measure fact. Um, all metrics are flawed. Counter is flawed. And don't tell my boss that I said that, but <laughs> all metrics are flawed. Counter is flawed. Citations are flawed. All metrics are flawed. It's only when we use them in conjunction that we get something resembling a true picture of the value of a piece of work. That's great. Well, well, diplomatically said. Thank you. Everything's um, there's, a, there's a good question here from Sharla, um, mm -hmm. Sharla Lyr Lyricis, who said, um, since libraries are considering not just justifying investing in OA book programs for research, but also teaching and learning, um, other than open syllabus projects and annotations um, for platforms that have that feature, do you have recommendations for metrics that are associated with teaching and learning activity? Yes and no. So I would always say it's worth looking at the number of students who will be potentially engaging, potentially engaging with um, open educational resources. So if you've got uh, the potential for an OER that will be used by 300 students compared with one that will be used by 10, you might want to consider that in your funding decisions. Um, I would also suggest looking at any metrics that the platform provider can give you about interaction. So if there are quizzes, how many students have completed the quiz? If there is an option to create annotations, how many students have taken up that option? But I would also say it's worth doing some qualitative assessment on that as well, because not everything is about numbers. I know with people, we like numbers, but actually speaking to the students or surveying the students in some fashion is a really good way of getting feedback on that investment. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I suppose that there are there are quests, some questions here that might be beyond beyond your remit. Someone's asking whether you know reading list software can tag OA items and track usage, and I, I think that that would be a really powerful um, set of of metrics. But it will depend on whether, of course, people set these these texts on their reading lists for their courses. Um, it mm -hmm. can't always be the case that you know the the resources you need are open access. But we could start to think about whether we need to pressure commercial the commercial sector to start flagging open access in its what it reports to us. So this was actually something that came up. OK, so back in 2016, when we started talking about release five, we spent eight or nine months trying to define open within the context of counter. And we know we didn't get it right because we've had a lot of commentary since. Um, and the situation has moved on substantially. So we have had another attempt and we still haven't got it right, but we have, I think, got a better definition. One of the challenges that we were trying to pin down and um, one of the, the issues that we're trying to, to resolve with release 5.1 is coming up is open access content that is either indexed or is also available in a sort of mirror format in controlled databases. So I'm thinking about things like Ex Libris or the EBSCO databases, which 
have started to index content that is openly available, but they are themselves controlled databases. You can only search those databases and see results if you are logged in and your institution has a, a subscription. So for counter purposes, we are suggesting, and we are, this is one of the key points of the consultation, we are suggesting that whether a piece of content is controlled or open or free to read is determined by the platform on which the usage occurs, not necessarily the license under which it was originally published, because we don't necessarily have a mechanism for auditing. Our, like, from counter's perspective, we do not have a mechanism for auditing whether a piece of content has a specific license, but our audit process will take into consideration whether something was controlled on a particular platform. So I dread to think how many hours of my collective technical group's lives have been spent on the question of how to define open, uh, but we would, we, we've come to the end of the road that we can manage internally and we really need community feedback on that piece in particular. We're not expecting it to be perfect, but we do hope we've, we've improved the definition of open. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Tasha. Um, I've really appreciated that and the, the fine distinctions you've made and, and helping us to pull apart book and journal metrics and thinking about how we can appraise uh, these new models in a, a kind of brave new world of, of metrics and narratives um, side by side. Um, I'm going to hand now back to David to introduce um, our final set of speakers, um, giving us a library perspective um, on OA monographs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, and, and thank you to Tasha as well for for a really interesting presentation. So we're now going to uh, shift uh, towards the, the the view from from the library, if you like. We've been talking uh, quite a bit already about um, uh, some of the issues uh, around acquisitions, about uh, prioritizations and justifications, and and making the case for um, for open access and and and, and, and monographs. And so we're going to hear from. Um, 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 Simon Baines and Sarah Thompson, um, who are going to give them as their perspectives. Um, if I introduce Simon first, Simon's the um, university librarian at the University of Aberdeen, and he's held that position since uh, 2019. Before that, he was the deputy uh, librarian at Manchester. And before that, he was uh, back up in Scotland, um, where he had senior positions uh, at both the University of Edinburgh and the National Library of Scotland. And we'll ask um, um, uh, Simon to speak, then I'll very quickly introduce uh, Sarah, and then after Sarah's spoken, we'll have a discussion and, um, and uh, sort of a pooled uh, question and answer session. So Simon, if I can hand over to you. Thank you, David. I will share my screen and hope that works. David, are you seeing the right version of PowerPoint? Um, indeed, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, very beautifully blue Abedonian sky. And that is actually how it looks today. That's Brilliant. Well. <laughs> so, okay, so I'll just make sure I can see my, my own notes. So I'm going to start with some background context as it ex explains what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Uh, anyone who knows me will know I can talk relentlessly about open access publishing. So today I'm taking a different tack. I'm going to look mainly at how we consume uh, open access uh, content and, and books in particular uh, and the issues I'm seeing there. And other speakers have already started to talk about the solutions to some of those issues, which is great. Uh, and I should say as well, these are issues some of my colleagues are observing rather than me to, uh, to, to a large extent. So I want to acknowledge my acquisitions manager, Ross Hayworth, and cataloguing and scholarly communications manager, Emma Francis, for the data I'm going to show you and a lot of the thinking. Uh, and I should say that I and they will welcome ideas and solutions from others. I don't want to pretend that I'm here today to provide all the answers, possibly not even ask all the right questions. I'm sure we have an audience, we're already seeing that we have an audience of very experienced people who will be able to comment on and correct some of the things I say here. Uh, and I want to make a point as well, having looked at the chat, that um, my, my driver here uh, is not necessarily one that works for everybody. So the reflections on what worked for me, uh, don't blame me uh, if they're not working for you. 
Um, so Aberdeen, three years since I arrived, I've started being more vocal and opinionated about open research. And this is aimed at positioning the library as more central to it, which is quite a shift from where I, it was back in 2019. And I do have a really helpful lever to pull here. Uh, we have a 527 year old foundational purpose, uh, which says that the university was founded on the basis of being open to all and dedicated to the pursuit of truth in the service of others. Our university principal and vice chancellor, Professor George Boyne, never begins a speech without saying that. So it's a really powerful statement for me to use to argue that Aberdeen needs to be open with its research outputs. Otherwise, it's not delivering on the vision upon which it was founded. Nevertheless, advocacy remains really important to me. Earlier this year, a school research director picked up on a commitment in our recently released research culture report and challenged it at the university's research committee. And it was talking about the importance of open research. In his view, that was something that was being imposed on us by our funders. There was nothing we could do about it or any other reason to be interested in it, which is hugely dispiriting for me, but I've worked on that. And I think I've turned him around. So part of the challenge for me has been to persuade academics to talk to me about it rather than talk to our research office. I arrived at Aberdeen, as David said, 2019, and it would be fair to say the library was not central to open research at that point. It was very much about the administrative support. We didn't have a dedicated team. We don't have funds beyond the block grants, which for us are pretty modest in comparison to other Research Libraries UK members. And I know that's not necessarily true of some of you in the room. Um, and I know I've got colleagues from my uh, scholarly comms operation here today. So I'm really pleased they're here and I'm pleased we have them now in these roles. Uh, so it's taken me a while to build up the resources and the skills, but I'm now talking publicly about the library's open research leadership at the university and, and making some reasonably provocative statements. So I wrote a series of posts on the university's blog site recently, and you can see a couple of quotes here, which are, are challenges to my colleagues at the university. And it's off the back of building up a level of trust and respect that I feel I can start to do more to invest in publishers who rely on library support as a sustainable business model. So am I putting my money where my mouth is on this? And the answer to that is not nearly enough. Um, so what you're seeing here is a breakdown of the proportion of spend that we are putting against a number of open access initiatives, not all books, of course, um, and it also includes the, the DOAGE supporter fee. We've recently been added to the DOAGE list of supporters, which is great. And this is a very small, very small percentage of our overall content budget. Uh, but the context here is that's against the backdrop of year on year library content reductions up to around 2018. So there's no slack. And these are investments which are either displacing other acquisitions or they're coming from available savings. Um, so the money I'm putting into it is modest, but I am ambit ambitious to do more. And this gets us into the conversation we've had already about the transition of library content budget from, from a subscription and purchase model to another sort of model. So what I'm trying to signal to my colleagues is that I'm shifting subscription payments. The savings on Science Direct will be significant for me. They will remain in my budget. And what I'm starting to do is look at how I use that money to shift what I'm doing over uh, to sustainable open access. And I'm making public statements about doing it. And you'll have seen if you follow me on Twitter, that's what I'm doing. But I'm actually aiming at an internal audience as much as anything here. I want to establish that this is a defensible position on using the funds. And it's part of my strategy to position the library as a leader and connect it with wider university strategy. Uh, and I couldn't have done this in 2019. Um, it was way off the radar for many people in the institution. And very few people were looking to the library to lead. The mindset was focused on the library as space and as source of information in the traditional way. Uh, and I don't want to disabuse anyone of the fact that, that, that it is an important space. We have an amazing space here in, in the Sir Duncan Rice Library. And I'm not saying that just because Chris Banks will be wrapping up later and she led the creation of the building. It's a real privilege to work here and I feel it every day as I come in. But I want to widen what the library is and what it does in the minds of my academic colleagues. And Sarah, after me, will talk more about embedding the, this thinking in collection strategy and some of the things we talked about before about the assessment of return on investment, um, as well as doing this because we should. How do we demonstrate the value uh, to our colleagues? 
Um, so, of course, we acquire thousands of open access titles through a variety of ebook collections. Um, what I'm, you're seeing in this infographic is our largest OA book collections, those with over 2,000 titles, as determined by records in our catalogue. And this represents about 190,000 titles for us. The long tail, which I'm not showing you, is another 40 collections, but it doesn't add very much more. It takes us a little bit over 200,000. And it's important to say this isn't deduplicated. And, and as we've started to discuss today, getting accurate data is one of the things that's an issue for us. So we're building it, um, but will they come? And this really relates to what we've just been hearing. Um, we, we struggle to measure uh, our e-resource use. We struggle even more to measure our open access e-resource use. But I am pleased to be able to say that I've been using uh, just reports, using counter five data. So a good segue from, from the last presentation. Um, and it's good and perhaps unsurprising to see the, the rise over 2020 and 2021, uh, but we've talked about the caveats. We're looking at the usage that can be traced back via IP here. We know that is probably a small proportion of it overall. Uh, we also got in touch with open book publishers for data traceable to IP range and, and got data from them as well. And what you're seeing on the left here is the most popular title from open book publishers. It's about Scott's Law, uh, a recent tribute to a a very well-regarded Glasgow academic. So this is the problem, uh, and I know some of you are thinking particularly about this problem, about how do we make the case to invest in open access publishing based on use rather than principle. And this was what was holding me back in 2019. I didn't have the confidence at that stage to say, you know what, we should be doing this. It's the right thing to do, rather than thinking about it as a business case. I'm confident to do that now, and I know I'm in a particular context. Um, but I've, I do still also care about showing the benefits. And so Sarah will talk a bit about this in the moment. And that's key. Uh, for you if you're in an institution where the ethical principle around research publishing openly is not compelling enough. Though I was wondering about other strategic levers you can pull. Most institutions will say something about how much they value inclusion, how much they value community engagement. Um, so where research performance might be less of a useful basis, uh, are there other things in your strategy you can align this with? Um, and then when, if they come, will they find anything? There are a lot of cataloging and discovery issues. Records can be of hugely variable quality. Um, we're seeing some improvement from, from those records where they come directly from publishers, but some of them are awful. Uh, discovery systems can be poor at accurately indicating what is open access. Uh, we have multiple packages. There's a lot of crossover on titles. It's really hard, if not impossible, to have an accurate idea of the number of OA books we have access to. And we have the issue of, bad, of deduplication, and that's made more difficult because the records are so bad. Uh, when we use filters in discovery systems, they cut out, in our experience, a lot of the results that they shouldn't. Uh, quality control. So here's an example of a really terrible catalog record. Um, and it's from an organization that some have regarded as predatory, but it's in DOAB. Uh, and DOAB make the claim that you can trust what is in, in DOAB. But I have seen at least one institution, several, several actually, but I, I look particularly at the guidance from one institution in the States, which asked authors to be careful about considering publishing with this particular publisher. Um, and even if this is a quality book, how does anybody find it with a catalog record like that? And, and indeed, why isn't better? Uh, I had a look at the Intech Open site and they do have Dublin core records, but we're not getting them. And they're for reasons beyond my ken, um, and there may well be folk in the room who understand this more than I do. And just today, I saw via Twitter what looked like a really interesting open book coming out of an Australian university, but I don't know if it will appear in the resource I receive records in. It's not in DOAB. Do we sit and wait? Do we catalog it locally? Difficult to know. Um, so I'm coming to the end now. Um, I've talked about how we find, record and discover or not open access books. Sarah will talk a bit more about how we publish them. But I'll finish by saying that we've been working hard on pushing the notion of open in Scotland for years. And I wanted another excuse to use Derek Law's brilliant paraphrasing of the Declaration of Our Broth here, which launched the Scottish Declaration on Open Access way back in 2005. And I'm long enough in the tooth to have been there at the time and part of the formulation of that work. And for those that don't know Derek Law, as he's been retired for some time, he was uh, quite a name in the library profession back then. He's held director roles at Strathclyde and King's College London.
As recently as this month, William Nixon from Glasgow was in Denver at the Open Repositories Conference talking about the power of open access in Scotland, the strength of our repositories. And we have SCURL here, the Consortium of University and Research Libraries in Scotland, which has developed the Scottish University's Press. And just last week at Aberdeen, we issued a press release about the relaunch of Aberdeen University Press. It's 100 years old, but it's now managed by the library and we're about to uh, develop it into an open access publisher. So I think my determination to accelerate our commitment to open is part inspired by the work we started in 2005 and I'm taking inspiration from colleagues and I want to acknowledge Glasgow and their work on institutional repository development and Edinburgh who you probably know have so recently blazed the trail on rights retention strategy. So that's a sort of strategic context and my motivation for all of this. Uh, David that's the end of my presentation. Uh, brilliant. Thank you, uh, Simon. Uh, really uh, a, a quick whiz through some of the key issues and already begin to see how we can tie together um, some of the things that we've talked about earlier um, uh, uh, with, with, with what, what you're saying. As I say, we'll, we'll take uh, questions in the discussion uh, in, in a moment after we've heard from Sarah Thompson. Uh, Sarah's Head of Content and Open Research at the University of, of York. Uh, there she chairs the University's Open Research Operations Group and she's a member of, for us for the RUK Digital Scholarship and Collection Strategy Networks. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Right. So, yeah, I, I have the privileged position of coming last today. So that means a lot of what I'm saying will be echoing the thoughts of others before me, which is a great position to be in. Um, but I'll just give a little bit about a context at York to start with. And I realise that we are um, actually very fortunate in some respects in, in being able to push push the door of open to the extent we can. But that is actually due to having um, done a lot of work in this space, um, both um, within the university and, you know, and externally for, for a number of years. And I think we're now finally starting to, to reap the benefits of that. And what we've been able to do more recently is that in response to the University of York's new strategy and its vision of York as a university of public good, which is something that we're, we're saying very frequently now. Um, and again, this it's interesting what Simon was saying about his founding statement. At York, this is very much echoing the founding statement of the university, but that only dates back to the 1960s. But even so, um, setting that in the current day context um, and very much thinking about how open fits in with that and also about um, community engagement um, and engagement with the world more broadly. So that those are all really useful levers, um, as Simon was saying, to, to pull on when we're, when we're talking um, within the university around open and what it means. So we've taken the opportunity um, to develop a new library roadmap in response to the university's strategy. And I've just pulled out here a couple of statements that really show our commitment and our strengthening commitment to different aspects of open. Um, the wording in these is still draft, but it, it's, I've included them really just to highlight where our thinking is um, and why we're in a position, I guess, to, to move on this to the extent we are. So we're able to say that we're providing leadership and expertise in open research at the university, for example. Um, We've had, a, as David mentioned in the introduction, um, we have an open research operations group, university-wide, which I chair. And there is a strategic group um, partnered with that, which, which I sit on as well. And that's been running now for almost three years. And that's been really instrumental in positioning the library um, in this area. And we, you know, we take a really active role in leading on the work of those groups and actually do a lot of the work that comes out of the resulting action plan um, to drive various initiatives forward. And the second uh, um, statement here um, is about our focus on open access in publishing, open access publishing and um, open educational resources. And in particular referencing here, our continuing and deepening investment in um, the development of the uh, services that we run with our partners in the White Rose in the White Rose University Library collaboration. So we partner with Leeds and Sheffield to deliver um, our institutional repositories, and we've been doing that for a um, since ooh, I think about two thousand and seven, um, if not even earlier than that. 
So we have the only joint uh, repository in the UK. Um, and now we, more recently, we've invested in setting up um, a joint university press, which is still quite small scale, but we have to date um, published a number of, of monographs in the arts and humanities and a small number of journals as well. So what we're seeking to do through these statements is further demonstrate um, our commitment um, publicly within the university to um, continuing to invest in these services and in other areas of open content. Now, we have a set of policy statements about our collections, which we drew up a few, a few years ago now. And you'll see there that the one I've highlighted, again, is really foregrounding um, the importance of open access publishing to us. And just it just states there very simply that we will incorporate open content into our collections. Um, and the strength and commitment to open, which we make in our roadmap, will re um, result in us spending increasing amounts of our budget, increasing proportions of it on open content. So I mentioned White Rose University Press, and for us, this has been, this was an early, I guess, early indicator, even before we were investing in, in the open, another open monograph um, initiatives. We decided, we looked around um, and decided that we wanted to set up our own press because we really wanted to make a difference, even in a small way, to the, um, to the publishing uh, marketplace. We wanted to support academics who had interesting material. They struggled to publish because it wasn't commercially viable. We wanted to help um, scholarly research reach a global audience. Um, we wanted the power to be with, our, with academics and not publishers. Um, but we were frustrated, as I know every, everybody around the table will be, um, as we watched scholars signing away their rights in publishing contracts, for example. Um, we, and we really wanted to provide an alternative um, to the ever increasing costs, um, particularly of scholarly journal publishing. And as I mentioned, our output is still small, but we are a fully open access press. Um, and our model for monographs is currently operating on um, book processing charges. But as was mentioned earlier, we're thinking about how, how we can move on that. And what that means in practice is that we, we attract authors who come with research funding or authors with our, within our own institutions, because as libraries, we, we, um, we fund the book processing charges um, for our own academics. But obviously what that then means is that we're not attracting a wider pool of academics who may not have funding. So we're thinking about what we can do about that. And that's one of the reasons for us applying to be on the JISC uh, Open Access Community Framework recently. So, so the, the press is a really important initiative for us um, and working on it collaborative, collaboratively, we can achieve something that we would have really struggled to do alone. These are some of the initiatives we've supported to date. Um, we want to see greater diversity of business models in publishing, as we signaled when we set up our own press. Um, and as I've mentioned, we do intend to support more community-led initiatives, and that's not just content, but also tools and infrastructure as well. And I just wanted to say a little bit about my experiences of talking to authors about open access monograph publishing as we have our own press. Um, and so I do get into conversations with people from time to time. Um, and my experience of talking to, to the more established um, academics, particularly in arts and humanities, is that they do have a lot of concerns about open access monographs. Um, open access journal publishing is not particularly embedded in many arts and humanities and social science dis disciplines yet, certainly not in comparison to the sciences. Um, and therefore, the shift from traditional to open access monograph publishing is a big change for many academic authors, and they do have concerns and anxieties. There's also a lot of misunderstandings, so for many of them, but per but processing charges are the only model that they've heard of. And they just can't imagine how this can possibly scale to be something that's viable across, um, across academia. And they think, well, how on earth is our university going to be able to afford this? There is also, uh, I think, something I've encountered is a mistrust um, from, 
perhaps I say, from the more established um, academics. A slight mistrust in publishers who they've not worked with before or who they haven't heard others' experience of working with them. So that is that is a hurdle that sometimes we come across um, um, as a publisher ourselves. Um, authors also worried about loss of prestige if they go with someone untried and untested. And ref always comes up in every conversation, <laughs> it seems. Um, and getting the incentives right around ref will, um, will be a key driver that will really influence how our academics behave and what they what they step up to do much more easily. I think REF could really help with that. At the moment, it's seen as something that is there to worry about because we don't yet know what's coming. And overall, they, they can feel quite comfortable with the status quo. And unless there is that push of some reason, um, I think there is a level of inertia there. I do think we can counter a lot of this with much more positive messages about open access monographs. Um, and being able to point to alternative models um, in inf um, written about in ways that um, the layperson who isn't intimately um, connected with this can actually understand, I think will really help. So hopefully the Open Book Collective will help us with that um, and the Open Access Community Framework, as, as these will be things that libraries themselves can more easily get to grips with in lots of information kept in one place. Um, and then we can more easily translate that back to our academic audiences. We do feel um, that it would be helpful for some of our academics to hear from um, the, the peers that they respect at other institutions, particularly. So the people who are, if you like, the superstars of their disciplines, if they're seen to be publishing um, open access monographs and are willing to talk about their experiences, I think that would be incredibly powerful. Um, and I won't dwell on this final point about the UKRI funding pot because we covered that quite a bit earlier, but more information about the specifics of how that's going to work and how people can apply for it would be really welcome because um, you know, people are signing their publishing contracts already. So why should libraries support open monograph initiatives? Um, I think many libraries will feel that the values of open access publishing align with them. And if they if they are able to, I think most people are indeed willing to demonstrate that commitment financially. However, I would say that we do still need to prioritize and be selective. You know, we can't support everything and that therefore we are going to be looking for things that really um, do align with our teaching and research requirements. So I think we just have to be realistic and there may be some one-off pots of money that we can put into experiments, but talking about making this more sustainable going forward, we do need to be able to show how things easily map onto what the main, uh, I guess, research and teaching um, and learning requirements are at our own universities. And what we expect in return for our investments is obviously we want good quality content and good publishing opportunities for our academics. Um, we also want good and transparent governance because if these are community-led initiatives that we have the op opportunity to be involved with, we expect openness and transparency around that and how decisions are made and like, would like to be involved in those decisions if possible. Um, and equally important that we have, uh, we have information about how things have been costed um, what investments are being made. Um, so as costs go up, and if we're going to continue investing in them or in increasing number of things, we just want certainty that um, we have clarity over what, what is happening there, I think. And I, I just wanted to finish up by saying some a few things around how as a library we're thinking about this so this is not just about what we're saying up front in our policies our strategies or what we're purchasing thinking about how um, accommodating and open and leading in this area of open is really transforming what we do within the library and that's not just in the tools and the infrastructure um, that we're providing but also thinking more about how we structure our teams how people's roles and responsibilities are configured so that open isn't something that 
um, people lack confidence in talking about internally in the library and going out and talking to academics. It'd be great if our academic liaison team, for example, had much more confidence and understanding of this. And that's down to us in, in my area, not just um, working on this in isolation, but thinking about how we actively promote um, training and awareness raising within other teams um, of our colleagues. Um, and then that, that message of um, open access, open research and what it can do and how it ties into the university mission is, is something that everybody feels that they have um, ownership and buy-in of. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah. That's brilliant. Simon, if you can, if you can return to us um, virtually, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's sort of um, the, the, the common themes uh, in, in, in both your presentations there were that was that alignment with, uh, you know, with, with the values and ethos of, of the university, making clear that that's the, 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 that they do sort of um, work in parallel and using that as a, as, as, as a lever, I think is, uh, is, is really interesting. Um, I'm trying to have the, oh gosh, that's something, um, Neve. Uh, Neve, do you want to come and say this rather than me reading all this out? I'm not very good at reading out loud. Okay, um, David, great to see you there. Can you hear me? Oh, we can indeed, yes. Hi, um, so I'm, I'm just curious because of all the wonderful work that's going on here, but for me, it's really come to pass with, with academics um, complaining about not getting access to the resources that they need, which we've had across the board in arts humanities, especially. And I said to them, will you think about this the next time that you're publishing? So my question really is that of what now libraries have tended to focus, I think this is fair to say, on promoting usage of the content they paid for and gave mm -hmm. little or no con attention to highlighting open access content coming from the outside right so hopefully that will be agreed by people and I want to know has any library like in Scotland or, or York or anywhere else worked with the as Sarah said with the faculty liaison librarians and looked at the reading lists and these you know the what are required by faculty with a view to substituting the paid for content with the significant amount of high quality open access content that's out there not only that when they make that substitution to flag it in their catalogues as open access and to promote it to academics, for example, in reading this and saying, have you thought about open access alternatives for this? Because we must be talking about in some subject areas, at least between 20 and 50 percent of high quality content now being available on open access. So if anybody has worked in this area, I'd be really interested to hear from mm -hmm. them. So I can just respond to that first, if that's OK, Simon. So. We, one thing I, I meant to mention when I was talking and failed to dismally, is that as part of um, White Rose Libraries, we've been working on an, um, an OER toolkit. Um, and that's one of the things that we'll be rolling out over the summer to, in particular, help our liaison librarians have conversations with academics um, around alternatives to a material that's on reading lists. So we're, we're thinking particularly about um, OER, OERs, but also you're quite right, it can cover open access monographs as well. Um, and re we really want to find solutions to this, as you've indicated. So, so we're working collectively on, on that toolkit at the moment and it will be ready for the autumn term. But it's really, it's one of the primary aims of doing that is really to help increase people's confidence in having those conversations and increase their levels of understanding. That sounds amazing, Sarah. Thank you. I watched that space uh, for sure. So hopefully I'll see more um, news about that on Twitter. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Simon, did you want to post yeah. comment as well? So I, I don't know, or I, I can't think off the top of my head whether there's been any uh, Scotland-wide analysis here, at least not recently, and there may well be somebody else representing Skirl here who could, who could add something to the chat if there's something I'm, I'm not aware of or have forgotten. I think here it's been more about conversation than analysis of the collections at the moment. It's been engaging with academics and starting to make them aware of why they should be thinking about open content. And I think if if anything came out of the pandemic that was was positive it was the the awareness raised about access to digital content particularly access to textbooks and the insane costs associated with that um i'll just i'll just add an anecdote really and then i'll then i'll, I'll move on david i think but the one of the things that happened early on was i had 
one of my academic colleagues wanting to know whether she could make her textbook, her own textbook, co-authored with some other, another institution available openly. Um, and we had to help her liaise with the publisher and all the copyright was with the publisher. The publisher said no. Um, the cost was prohibitive to do it electronically. Um, and, and here's the, the, the good bit. Uh, the book was about intellectual property law. Uh, so, you know, e even in that space where, where we've got, you know, academic expertise, the, the, the understanding is, is low, but it certainly raised the profile. Um, and I've got a much more receptive audience now for thinking about open. Um, and I'm, you know, working with academics to think about that, uh, as well as the other things they should be thinking about, which we're now working with on. So we're, we're looking at flagging in reading lists, for example, whether they've considered decolonization. Um, as something in in terms of the books they're putting forward, uh, we can also flag with them. Have you is have you considered an open version of a title as well? That's great. Um, thank you. Oh, sorry, Neve, were you going to respond? No, I just think that's great. I mean, I think it's really important to highlight the open access content. Up until very recently, in some libraries close to to me, um, we didn't even put our um, open access journals of such significance as plus one in our electronic journals holdings because it was open and free and we didn't pay for it, right? So that's the kind of thing, it's almost like there's two libraries. There's the library that pays for stuff and then there's the library that's doing all this great work on open access and, and on publishing work and so on. But we have to do what I think our computer scientists say, they have this horrible expression, which is to eat your own dog food. I think that sounds really disgusting, but I think it's well meant that you're supposed to practice what you preach, you know? So, and I think libraries across the board really need to start doing that. Otherwise, it's going to start looking like open washing. Libraries, please pay attention. Yes. I, 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 I assume that because you know systems have built up over decades and decades of, of how you handled hand, how one handles uh, purchase material, it's very difficult to then slot in open access material into that. And it's taking some time to come up with the with the, the systems for, for doing that. Uh, Paul, you've been very patient. You've had your hand up and um, uh, camera on. Uh, can, we, can we turn to you? Hi, uh, David. Thanks very much. And uh, I apologise. Um, I'm a late arrival at this uh, meeting today. I'm afraid I had meetings the first uh, half of this afternoon, but I've been listening for the last um, hour or so. I just wanted to pick up the point that, that uh, was raised about um, advertising open access to um, to academic colleagues. And to use one example here in UCL, which has been astonishingly successful in the last few months in, in yet further uh, raising awareness. It, it, we have a press, of course, UCL press and open access press, and partly as a result of the high costs of commercial OA e-textbooks during the pandemic, we've launched, we were encouraged to launch by the CD managers here in uh, UCL, an open access e-textbook platform in the press. And we started commissioning authors, uh, UCL authors, to turn their lecture notes and the textbooks they would have published with a commercial publisher uh, to publish them with us. And we're aiming particularly at, um, but we're working with faculty tutors and working particularly with um, people on uh, teaching contracts who aren't necessarily on research contracts as well. So don't have the burden of uh, submitting to the ref uh, as well as writing a textbook. And there's really a tremendous amount of interest as I've been going around last uh, three months talking at the leadership teams of all 11 faculties and there is universally uh, interest in turning some of the educational resources that we produce for our students into OA material published by the press so I think open access educational materials is a, a great way to advertise open access to academics and b the next big thing for oral UK libraries in terms of creating OA content. Uh, really interesting. Thank, thank you, Paul. I, I don't know if there's if, if that resonates. I saw Sarah nodding uh, at, at one point there. Uh, I don't know if you, Sarah, or, or, or Simon have comments as a response. I, I would just, just, just add um, that we, we have, as, as I've mentioned today, just uh, launched 
Aberdeen University Press, at least as a as, a, as something on its way. And one of the things we we've agreed in in er, early in scoping the project around that was we weren't thinking purely about research outputs. There's obviously a need to think about open educational resources, um, and we have some demand. I've been talking particularly to the School of Medicine about about what they want to do. So we're we're we're, we're ambitious about the press. We're, we've got a long way to go, and I've been very um, pleased to have help and support and information from Paul's colleagues at UCL about about how they've done that. Um, but yes, we, we want the remit to be wide and we want it to include educational outputs as well as research. That's great, brilliant. Um, uh, the comment from uh, Katrina there in the um, in in the um, about in, in in the chat about creating uh, OA handbook for undergraduate teaching. Do you want to just say what um, for people who don't know where, where you're, Katrina, just in case anyone wants to get in touch and uh, uh, or, or 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 see uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, if you if you wanted to just say that in the in, in the chat, that'd be brilliant. Um, and a few comments. There's been lots of comments about metadata and um, the problems of metadata. I think. Simon, you 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 very clearly raised that with with the example, but the 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 problems of 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 how we ensure good good metadata for for materials, and there's been some uh, interesting responses there as well within within the within within the comments. Are there any more comments or questions or or, or reactions to? Um, to, to specifically to what the library can be doing in, in this area. Or alternatively, Simon and, and Sarah, if there are things that you think that collectively, um, you know, we should be either people like RLUK and other organizations, or that we should be asking just to do, or that we should be asking UKRI uh, today to do. Um, if we if we still have our UKRI colleagues on, on the call, this would be an ideal opportunity to <laughs> Give them a list of uh, um, things. I think I think certainty and um, and uh, around eligibility was was one thing uh, that we we picked up earlier. David, perhaps I could comment on. There's a question just come in, just landed about rights retention. Oh yes. Um, so, how important do you think it is in the monograph world, if at all? Um, mm -hmm. I think there's no reason why rights retention shouldn't be uh, something that all research outputs are subject to in the theory. Um, we are working on rights retention at Aberdeen. I know others are as well. And I was really interested to see Sheffield Hallam have launched a rights retention policy uh, just this week, I think. Um, I'm being really careful about it for obvious reasons here. It's very, very clearly constrained to uh, journal articles and conference proceedings. But what I do say in covering papers is uh, monographs are out of scope for now, you know, and I think we, we, we will be really interested to see where things go with UKRI on this. Um, but in my view, I can't, I can't see any logical reason uh, why monographs shouldn't be subject to rights retention. It's more about the advocacy and the persuasion and the reassurance and all of these things that is, that's needed before we can get some of our colleagues over the line on that. Yeah, I would agree with that, Simon. I think I think many of our colleagues um, in the arts and humanities would, as, as I mentioned, I, I think there's some way off accepting open access monographs to introduce rights retention at too early a stage as well in relation to that. It might just might just tip things over the edge. Um, so we're also working on rights retention for journal articles at, um, at York as part of the work that um, the N8 libraries are doing across the north of England. Um, but again, we're framing it very much around just to, to the journal articles at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Rachel is, is responding um, from a UKRI point of view, um, saying they weren't, were, after consultation uh, and consideration, it, they weren't quite at that, at that stage to, 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 to put that in, which is great. Um, I, I, a last question, perhaps, for if I may, to 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 Simon and Sarah. I mean, we've I, th I think I've heard different people at different times today say this constituency. Uh, you know, younger people are more keen on new models, or older people, you know, who are well established and have tenure are, are keener. Is is there is there actually any clear demographics that you're seeing? Or, or does it vary um, across age groups, across across positions, and across disciplines? Yeah, I think my personal feeling is it varies enormously. Um, but we 
my but I think at York and I don't know if this is true <laughs> everywhere I suspect not I think almost inevitably that if well as I mentioned if we have established academics who've already who've already published um and have certain expectations around that their work will be submitted to to ref and that they they feel very secure about what what they understand to be high quality and what their peers understand to be high quality they are more conservative I would say almost without exception now I know it's hard to, to make sweeping statements there's always exceptions but um yeah that's certainly my my experience so so I, I, I would say yes, it does vary, and, and I think it, discipline is a driver as well. You know, some some, some academics are very used to to preprint repositories, and, and others aren't. So I think there's a there's a disciplinary issue there. Mm -hmm. I, I would say I'm seeing tremendous energy from some early career researchers who are really really passionate about it, possibly a little naive, um, setting up their own journals and absolutely refusing to, to entertain the notion that there should be any charges to anybody. And I wonder quite how sustainable that approach will be. But it's great to see the level of energy and enthusiasm amongst the early career research community. I think what I would say about the, the, the established researchers is it comes back to research culture for me. You know, they may be well established, they may be secure, but how important is um, supporting, encouraging and rewarding early career researchers for the right things? How important is that to them? How important is it, is it to a PI to encourage their, their, the next generation to think about publishing openly? And, and how can we move away from the kudos and the prestige of publishing in a particular journal and instead think about the kudos and prestige and career reward associated with making your research open. So that's what I'd like to see of our mm. senior researchers really think about how important it is to support the next generation and help and help them, you know, in the, in their careers as they start to move up. And what I hope we'll then get is a, is an established um, uh, set of new academics who are really, really um, behind this as, as, a, as a, an important part of the research culture they work in. Mm. Yeah, I think that's right, Simon. And I would I would just add that um, sometimes it can be because um, they just don't have the time to investigate new ways of doing things. Um, so one of the things that we're quite keen to, um, to do is is set up almost like reverse mentoring, because I know that um, having spoken to, to to people at quite senior level, they they haven't published open access themselves, um, but they're really keen to find out more from colleagues who have. Um, so that sharing of experience, I think, even internally, uh, people at different career stages, I think will help enormously. So that, that can be a two way thing. Brilliant. Well, thank you both uh, to, to, to Simon and Sarah for, for that really uh, very rich um, um, discussion. Um, much appreciated and uh, really exciting uh, things uh, happening both um, at York and, and White Rose and, and at, uh, at Aberdeen. And we certainly wish the, the new Aberdeen Press um, or revised and revitalised University Press um, um, all, 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 all the best. Um, we've given the hardest job perhaps of today uh, to our colleague Chris Banks, who is going to um, summarise <laughs> for us uh, the discussions that we've had uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm hoping I can see Chris. Um, Chris will join us shortly, I think. Um, just wait just a moment. Uh, maybe I've caught Chris by surprise. And so I'm, 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 I'm sorry, no, there's Chris, brilliant. So uh, for those of you, of you who don't know Chris, she's uh, the Director of Library Services and Assistant Provost at Imperial uh, College London, really deeply embedded in all of the OA discussions within the UK through membership of the JISC UK Content Negotiation Strategy Group, uh, helped to lead on the recent negotiations uh, with, with Elsevier. Uh, she chairs the JISC UK Content Ex Expert Group and is a member of the Sconal Content Strategy Group, also a member of the UK OA Monographs Working Group. And uh, most importantly for me, she's, uh, she's a very valued member of the RIUK board. Uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, David. And if Sarah was last, then I am first after last. Um, and as you say, with, a, with, with the challenge of, of uh, summarising what has been a very rich discussion today, um, 
I, I'm going to do this just through uh, just a series of, of little musings that may not have a particularly good narrative thread through them, but they, they're, they're at least grouped together under, under some headings. And I started off with, with why me? Because um, uh, because David very helpfully pointed out all, all the things that I've been doing in the open access arena, um, particularly externally. But um, I'm afraid I'm also the person that was um, jointly responsible for mothballing um, Imperial College Press. Um, and I'm also from an institution that publishes very few books um, of the nearly 4,000 um, outputs that we had to the ref, only two were books. However, um, I, uh, I have a deep interest, my, my background is humanities. I have two books with my name on the spines. I've contributed to others and I also still see this world through um, a learned society, one which publishes uh, both journals and monographs, and I'm seeking to work with them to, to um, understand what open access might mean for that very small, um, uh, very small learned press. So I, I do try to see these things from a wide number of angles, not just that from a um, uh, a band one disc institution um, in the UK. So first of all, just musings generally on OA monographs. Um, I've long said that I still think that I've seen more innovation in, um, uh, in a transition to open access. Um, uh, and I, I, I'm kind of heartened by Martin's view that uh, there probably are limited models, um, but I've certainly, been very heartened right from the beginning, even before there were significant mandates that we've, that we've had more innovation. But I think I've also seen more resistance um, from some in the academic community and also from some in the publishing community. And where I'm sitting at the moment, I kind of think a little bit about COVID and masks. If we get as many complaints about why we have to wear masks as why we don't have to wear masks, maybe we're doing something right. So I'm trying to work out whether we've got the, the balance right here yet, whether, um, uh, 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 but on the innovation side, we're seeing that being driven both by funders and by uh, the research community and increasingly so by the research community, which I see as a really good thing. I would agree with Martin that the REF policy is key. Um, my experience and data from the, uh, from the previous REF, REF policy still shows me that that policy was the single biggest driver of open access engagement um, on the journal articles front. And I, I, I hope that it can do the same for monographs and I hope it's crafted in such a way as to add um, that extra incentive. Um, and then I, I, on, the, on the business about us collectively selecting packages to support, the one note of caution I would um, uh, enter here would be our experience with UKRR, so the United Kingdom Research Reserve and the journal de deduplication, and also the various collective collection studies that have been undertaken both by um, um, OCLC and, and others, uh, and more, more recently through collection mapping tools, which kind of continue to reinforce the rareness is common um, uh, uh, amongst our collections. So I, I'm, I would, I'm cautious about us collectively selecting those those um, packages and contents to support. Thinking about sustainability and what we are sustaining, I would hope that we are sustaining opportunities for publishing and opportunities for, um, for all to publish irrespective of, of institution and career stage. Um, I hope we're sustaining quality and it was, it was interesting to hear uh, Tasha's comments on, on metrics, but with certainly with um, uh, with monographs, those are very, very definitely lagging metrics and therefore not necessarily a, a, at, a, at an item level um, as, a, as an indication of quality, but hopefully we will also have a means of assessing quality of publication venues uh, and particularly new ones, because at the moment 
in the, in the same way that journal title is is has been used, um, you know, badly or, or or for good reasons as a proxy a proxy for for quality. So I think we use publishing houses at the moment as a proxy for quality. Um, I hope we're um, sustaining diversity and reach. I hope that we are maybe thinking very hard about the extent to which um, uh, we should be sustaining those profit margins. And we certainly need to, to look to sustain um, um, library budgets and what those budgets can, can support. A question I would ask would be on global sustainability. Um, I wonder whether our, and I don't know what the answer is, but whether our UK actions are in danger of driving a further global disparity. We're, I'm, and I'm, I worry that we're, we're moving um, from a disparity for reading opportunities to a disparity of publishing opportunities. Um, and I think that's why I like the, um, uh, the kind of subscribe to a type models because hopefully they um, they minimize those dangers of, of that disparity using on our library budgets um journals we've moved or for a long time our journals have been purchased on a just in case uh, for read um so we we've had our subscriptions to journals before we actually know and we pay up front for stuff that we don't yet know what is going to be published um, but of course, we're now moving to a just-in-time model when we, particularly where we move, for, uh, when we're looking at article processing charges. Monographs, on the other hand, we've we've acquired on a just-in-time per, um, per, um, basis for for reading, and we've been gradually moving into that just-in-case with book packages, and certainly are also maybe moving there for open access. Um, we know that for, for different institutions, budgets are, are generally stretched and sometimes significantly devolved, making those high level strategic investments a challenge for some of our institutions. And also we've got the issue where we've got more readers than there are authors and funding authorship rather than readership uh, presents us with different um, challenges, especially if we continue to support the status quo. But hearing today, I think there's, um, that we are doing anything other than that. Um, and then going back to Martin's comment about the money is not in the right place, even if it is in the system. And I think the other kind of curveball that's hitting us at the moment, um, uh, and I'm encouraged by what Paul Eris says, but the extent to which the current ebook crisis is limiting opportunities to move forward with, um, with open access. Um, a teeny bit on copyright licensing and rights retention, because why would I not do that? Um, uh, I'm welcoming that concentration of focus on IPR. Um, it, it's interesting with our, in our institution that, that, that IPR, um, the focus has often been on, on scientific and commercializable, if that's a word, um, work. Um, and, and we've let that considerable monetization and monopolistic approaches to journal articles and brands happen just in the sideline. And, and, um, and that's that we're now seeking to address. Um, and when we look at licensing IPR, we've got very different discipline, disciplinary variations in terms of where IPR might arise with a much closer link between the research output and potentially marketable commodity in the humanities and social sciences. Um, whilst very, very noisy, licensing and copyright and rights retention have, have absolutely come to the fore over, over recent years, um, probably initially with our own work on the, on the UK SCL, but more recently um, with, with funders um, actually taking that opportunity to embed rights retention uh, requirements in there or rights assertion requirements in their policies. And whilst that's noisy, those funder calls, I think, are helping raise the issue further for both individual researchers and their institutions. And that current tension between funder, publisher and institution pro approaches, I'm, I'm really hoping will help make, drive that engagement further and to the advantage of open access. And then finally, so what, what can we do? We've got our challenges and our opportunities. I think with our challenges, one of the things we might want to do is look through a different lens and look at the risk of not 
moving forward with open access and with open science and open research. Um, and at my own institution, it becomes a really um, easy sell in the sense that the risk that I, I outline is the fact that we now have practically half a billion pounds worth of research funding uh, that comes into the institution with open access requirements. So you've got that on the one hand, and you've got um, the, the, the very welcome fund to focus on research culture and openness and collaboration um, uh, as, as the kind of balancing for that. Um, we have got a challenge of bandwidth, um, particularly for smaller institutions. And I think those of us at larger institutions um, need to remember that and need to, to give them all the support that we can and need to put ourselves potentially in their shoes and what, and what this means for them. Um, and we have got the behavior of some publishers being a challenge, but actually I, I see that, that that is probably driving an opportunity because we're now seeing um, uh, our own researchers recognizing that some of those publisher uh, actions are, are distasteful. So on the finally, I'll try and end on some opportunities. I'm really heartened that the number of models might be small. I'm heartened by the rising tide of researchers and the energy of researchers and those that are interested in open access. Um, on advocacy, I think we're well on that journey. I think as soon as Plan S was published, we recognized that that immediately kind of flung together our, um, our collection development and our open access departments uh, in a way that uh, whilst confusing for both at the start has led to some deeper conversations and, and the fact that we can no longer think separately about new content and about open access. They are, they are both becoming intertwined and we need to work further with our colleagues to, to get that cross, um, uh, cross library understanding of that. But finally, leadership. We are seeing incredibly encouraging, encouraging academic funder, publisher and library leadership and um, I really hope that this is the time uh, to harness that. I hope that is suitable as a wrap up. Thank you.